Pilipinas, magandang umaga. Dear registered participants and those who follow us at Facebook, good morning. Welcome to the second day of the National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene. We are live here at the Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene at the parish of St. John. At this point, we would like to call in Reverend Father Earl Valdez, parochial biker of the Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene for the opening prayer. You remember that we are in the presence of our Lord as we start our day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that has passed in which you journeyed with us in our pursuit of greater understanding of the faith in your Son, the Nazarene. As we embark on another journey today, continuing this National Research Forum, we ask for your guidance and accompaniment once more, believing that in this noble pursuit, we become closer to you who is wisdom yourself. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We now officially begin with our program to give the synthesis of the conference proceedings of the first day of our National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene. We call in Professor Felicidad Pereña. Good morning, Philippines in the world. Welcome to day two of, and the culmination of the first ever National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene. As convened by Monsignor D. Turner, Rector and Paris Priest of the Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene. We are streaming live via Facebook, and we are so joyful that we have a total of 400 plus participants and more tuning in. The recording will be available via the YouTube channel of the parish. And for updates, you may check, check us out at our website, nazarenostudies.org. We had a very exciting day one. Assistant Professor Christine I.B. Alarconogo, the host. The tone of the conference was set with the welcome remarks of Monsignor Hernando Coronel, whose valiant efforts also made his conference possible. Further inspiration was given by his eminence, Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagle, former Archbishop of Manila and Prefect of the Congress for the Evangelization of People, direct from the Vatican, where he is serving at present. The first plenary lecture was delivered by Professor Michael Charleston, or Chao Chua, of the University of the Philippines and the Lasalle University, who underscored the devotion of the Filipino faithful in their journey with the Black Nazarene in his paper titled 500 Limangdaang Taon ng Paglakad ng Bayan Kasama ang Poong Jesus Nazareno. He chronicled how Jesus as the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno and PJN became central to the Filipinos' understanding of Jesus Christ as Emmanuel and how it strengthened them throughout the various struggles in our history. The second plenary session was presented by Mr. Wilson Angelo Espiritu from the Ateneo de Manila University, whose paper titled Makadios at Makasampayanang Pamamanata sa Nazareno utilized a critical realist approach in his interdisciplinary methodology for a theological analysis of faith and devotion to the Black Nazarene. The first batch of papers for the parallel session yielded a tremendous harvest, the highlights of which I will run down as follows. In the paper, Batobalani Santiago by Erickson Javier of the Ateneo School of Theology, 
We see the popular profession of devotion in the Philippines as its contribution to the world, to the call for new evangelization. In the paper on the Venice and Nazareno by Michael de los Reyes of the School of San Juan, a probe was directed towards the Tagalog novena used in the minor basilica of Chiapo based on the Pagpipiam sa Mahal na Poong Jesus Nazareno in Takasi sa Chiapo with an imprimatur in the year 1950 and to the printed in 1984. In the paper, Traslasyon at Tilot, Kulagway ng Kagaling ng Hatid ni Jesus, Paul Mark Andres, who attended the Advanced Christian Spirituality of Fordham University in New York, used the lens of the intercourse of culture and the Judeo-Christian faith to focus on folk healing, like the age-old process of Tilot. In the paper, Bakit May Team Ang Mahal na Poong Nazareno of the Department of Sociology. Uh, one from the Department of Sociology and Astrophology of the University, uh, Professor Fernando Jansica delved on the issue of the color as it affects devotion of the Filipinos, positive that the blackness of the Nazarene poses no contradiction in the adulation of Filipinos for white skin. And it's past 9 a.m. We move on to the third plenary lecture titled Understanding Catholicism in a Shared Space for Religious Practices, an Analysis of Performing Sacred Vow to the Maestro Padre Jesus Nazareno of Chiapo by Assistant Professor Mark Inigo Macam Taliara of De La Salle. University, and it is my special honor to introduce my fellow Kalimpiteño and fellow Atlas Comasian, Dr. Mark Inigo M. Saliara. He is currently an assistant professor at the International Studies Department of De La Salle University in Manila. And Mark is also the founding for co coordinator of the LSU Southeast Asian Studies Program. Mark completed his PhD major in Southeast Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore and NUS. He previously worked at ISEAS, Yusof Ishak Institute in Singapore from 2008 to 2013. He also worked as an editorial and media assistant at the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines from 2003 to 2006. A graduate of the University of Santo Tomas, he took his Master of Arts, finishing Magna Cum Laude, major in philosophy in 2007. Mark was a visiting graduate student at the Center for Ibero Latin American Studies at the University of California in San Diego in 2015. Mark was also an IASACP scholar at the Institute of Advanced Study in Asian Cultures and Theologies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2018 and 2020-2021. His research interests include Southeast Asian studies, history, philosophy, culture, and religion focusing on Catholicism. Ladies and gentlemen, with great pride and honor, let us welcome Dr. Mark Inigo Macam Talyar. The COVID-19 became an important test for Kiapu Church on how to conduct virtual and limited religious gathering. While live streaming of Mass every Sunday is not new to Kiapu Church, the daily fully online Masses were implemented when the community quarantine was announced in the third week of March 2020. When the government imposed a modified lockdown, Kiapu Church was allowed to hold activities with limited capacity. In 2021, Quiapo Church decided to suspend the translation of Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno or the NPJN annual procession. 
early masses were held for the devotees to attend instead of the procession. And in lieu of the pahalik known as kissing of the image, the church held patanaw or viewing of the replica image. During the patanaw, the image of NPJN was temporarily transferred to the balcony of the church fronting Plaza Miranda two weeks before the actual fiesta day. In Quiapo, the presence of sacred objects like pictures or replicas of MPJN is an important aspect of performing panata or sacred vows of the devotees. These sacred images are crucial to the understanding of the religious devotion and motivation of the devotees. It presupposes their desire to perform their panata, to be with or close to NPJN. The power eminent from the religious object is believed by many devotees to bring happiness and joy. Before the March 2020 lockdown, the January 9 NPJN procession or the 2020 translation was held and lasted 16 hours. It was the earliest in the last 12 years when the translation was introduced in 2007. In contrast to the 2015 translation, with approximately 5 million devotees who attended the 21 hours long procession, the 2015 translation is still considered the longest re religious procession in the history of the Catholic Church in the Philippines. The procession started early morning of January 9 at Luneta Park, passing the streets of Quiapo District in Manila. The translation of NPJN of Quiapo is an event reenacting the official transfer of the image from Bagumbayan, an area near to the present-day Luneta Park and Intramuros, or the old world city of Manila, to Quiapo Church in 1767. During the procession, uh, many devotees want to touch the image of MPJN or pull the two 50-meter long robes of the image carriage. For many devotees, it is an act of faith and a way to perform their Panatao sacred vow. But for the Quiapo-based Catholic Brotherhood of Eos del Nazareno HDN, protecting the image of MPJN from danger is an act they need to perform for spiritual blessing. It is also an act to earn the highest praise and acceptance to the brotherhood. The implementation of the social distancing measures prohibited devotees from visiting the church. In 2021, Quiapo devotees marked the feast day of MPJN with limited capacity inside the church. The Metropolitan Manila Police Force also controlled the movement of people within the vicinity of the church. The limited capacity is similar to a self-contained group or religious bubble. A self-contained Catholic mass in Quiapo is aimed at following the government rules on gatherings. The limited capacity for religious gatherings has suspended the devotees' regular visit to Quiapo to perform their sacred vow of PSP. Although the online experiences of the devotee, especially watching the live broadcasts of the mass, is indeed a substitute for a sacred site during the lockdown, but for many devotees, performing their devotion, especially their panata, is what matters to them. It can be personal or inherited, online or physical. Either way, it is of utmost importance to both the young and older devotees, whether their petitions, prayers, or wishes are granted or not. Otherwise, a large number of them consider Panata as something to be fulfilled. As a preliminary research on the understanding of Catholicism in a shared space, it is objective of this study to contribute to the theoretical discussion and methodological approach to the study of religion in place and space. For Kim Not, religion can be located in places, communities, and objects. The presence of sacred objects is an important aspect in the devotees' PSB in Quiapo. The location of the devotees during their PSB, either physical or ritual, plays an indispensable role as a gathering mechanism. In the historical analysis of Catholicism in Quiapo, this study also considered the idea of the Febre, Foucault, and the two on space, knowledge, and power to produce a series of steps to analyze the location of religion. The study of place and space in an historical analysis of religion is still evolving. 
Some of the earliest scholarship on the subjects were generally limited to certain topics such as sacred space and pilgrimage, like for example in the works of De Liu, Liade, and Smith. In Gyapo, whether for religious purpose or circular activities, without a space to produce and shape, ideas and beliefs, as well as principles and values, will remain ephemeral, ungrounded, and unorganized. Moreover, socially constituted space is full of power and symbolism, a complex web of relations, of solidarity and cooperation. Although there were numerous studies associated with place and space, particularly in the areas of embodiment, performativity, and material culture, the impact of place and space had been felt according to not in the study of religion as much as in the field of social sciences and humanities. In her study of place in space, Lily Kong suggests some key themes for future research, such as sites of religious practice beyond the official sacred, religions in different historical and place-specific contexts, various geographical scale of analysis, different constitution of population, dialectics, and moralities. This study considers Kong proposal on a multi and interdisciplinary approach to the study of Catholicism in the Philippines. This study is both historical and ethnographic, using sources from the archives and fieldwork materials collected in the Philippines from 2013 to 2015 and then 2017 to 2022. Although the main approach of this study is ethnohistorical, which focuses on the contemporary interview data, is used in connection to the global historical processes. A hybrid approach was also utilized that combines face-to-face -face and online research techniques. In this slide, I would like to introduce a diagram summarizing the conceptual framework of this study. The conceptual tool of object actors, Pomomuesto and Komotacho, complement the theoretical understanding of place and space in the study of Catholicism in Quiapo. This study used two layers of investigation. First, the importance of Gyapo Church in the history of Catholicism in the Philippines. And second, the devotee's engagement with space for performing sacred bow and the use of internet in their practices. These two layers of investigation help in describing, interpreting how the situated body of the devotees make sense of their experiences revealed by Pamumwesto or placing of the self and Kumotatio or substituting a sacred site. In this study, the ritual practice and the location of the self to honor MPJN is called Pamumwesto. As PSB, Pamumwesto is how devotees place themselves in a religious space. Pamumwesto is happening inside the church or during the procession. Pamutacho, on the other hand, is how a devotee is substituting or exchanging a sacred site to the actual site. Here, devotees who could not go to the church because of the lockdown or for whatever reason could make their religious practices at home or online and receive the same blessing. Although the Spanish maritime trading across the Pacific Ocean was essentially commercial in functions, this trading system known as the Manila Galleon from 1565 to 1815 also served as an apparatus for communication and transportation. And through this, Catholicism, particularly the Tridentine Catholic practices, was transported to the Philippines. The implementation of the Tridentine policy is a period in which the ideas of devotion, sanctity, holy, and sacred took a new form and resulted in a complex network of religious ideas that influenced many Catholics for a long period of time. Although the Tridentine ideas of devotion lay out the condition for understanding Catholicism in the context of the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, as mentioned by Vicente Rafael, the idea of religious transformation emerged through the Filipinos' reinterpretation of symbols and signs, especially in their Catholic ritual practices. The elements of the Tridentim Catholicism known as Baroque were influential in the devotional practices of the devotees in Capo. Tridentine Catholicism is the result of the Council of Trent held in 1545 to 1563. While the Tridentine policy were originated directed towards the Counter-Reformation in Europe, this period also resulted in the rise of Baroque Catholicism. 
In Latin America and in other Iberian colonial territories, Baroque Catholicism became the source of knowledge production and the production of space. In the Philippines, Baroque became powerful symbols and sources of ritual expressions, which are distinctive in showing the devotee's innermost selfhood. In this study, the Philippines and Mexico historical and religious interaction focus on the role of the Manila Galleon in the transmission and transportation of Catholicism in the Philippines. It examines how missionaries, particularly the Order of Augustine Recollects or Agustinus Recoletos, were able to access the Philippines and the methods they used to expand their missionary activities beyond Latin America. Mexico became an important source of administrative manpower and become the financial center for both the royal government and for various religious orders across the Atlantic and the Pacific. Mexico City was also an important ecclesiastical and religious hub for missionary destined to Asia and other parts of Latin America. As missionaries bound for this area open had to pass through Mexico. The main argument is that Baroque Catholicism reached the Philippines through the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade. The influences can be seen in the popular religious practices in Quiapo. As a passenger ship, the people aboard the Manila Galleons varied according to direction. In July 1605, 14 Recoletos boarded a ship in Cadiz, Spain, sailing to Mexico. They boarded the Galleon Espiritu Santo from the port of Acapulco crossing the Pacific Ocean. Only 13 missionaries reached the Philippines in 1606. They landed first in Cebu on May 12 and reached the shores of Manila on May 31st. The Recoletos brought with them a life-size Christ carrying the cross from Mexico that became known as the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno or MPJN of Quiapo. Most of the Christocentric devotion that were introduced in the Philippines and Mexico were closely related to European practices, particularly during the Baroque period, but the devotional practices can be traced as far as the medieval times. The Christocentric devotion became very popular in the late 16th century or early 17th centuries. Following the decrease of the Council of Trent on the Liturgy of the Eucharist, the commemoration of Christ's Passion during Holy Week, and the veneration of the images of the saints. In the Philippines, this Christocentric devotion becomes sources of ritual expressions that can still be seen in contemporary places of religious practices. In 2021, the procession of Quiapo or translation of Mr. Padre Jesus Nazareno was canceled due to COVID-19 pandemic. The decision was confirmed by Quiapo Church Management and the city government of Manila. Instead of the procession, as mentioned, Quiapo Church held masses both online and physical with limited capacity inside the church. The traditional pahalik or kissing of the image was also canceled, but patanaw or viewing of the image was held at the balcony of the church fronting the historical Plaza Miranda. The pre-COVID-19 translation or the 2020 procession of MPJN ends before 9 o'clock in the evening that lasted 16 hours, the earliest in the last 12 years when the reenactment of the transfer was introduced in 2007. The history of the January 9 procession of Quiapo can be traced back to the official transfer of transferring of the image from the church convent of San Juan de Bautista in Bagumbaya, an area near the present-day Luneta Park in Ermita District, to the church convent of San Nicolas de Tolentino in Intramuros, and then to Quiapo Church. The origin of the image was attributed to a Mexican Nujal woodcarver who was commissioned by the Recoletos to create a life-size image of Christ. In 1606, the image arrived in the Philippines via the Manila Galleon from the port of Acapulco in Mexico. As mentioned, together with the image is a group of Recoletos and they are the original owner and caretaker of MPJN. According to tradition, the life-size statue was originally of fair skin color, just like the images of Christ commonly found in Europe. Quiapo is one of the 16 districts of Manila with a total land area of 85 hectares. Much of the Quiapo area remains residential in nature with families occupying the second floor 
of post-World War II houses while the ground floors are rented for commercial use. For many devotees, Kiapu Church countless stories of rising from the ruins because of the fires in the years 1603, 1791, and in 1929. Also the Chinese uprising of the year 1606, and then the earthquakes of 1645 and 1868. The pandemics of 1820, 1882, 1902, 1918, and currently the 2020 to 2022. It was demolished and rebuilt in 1863 and again damaged but not totally destroyed as you can see in the picture during World War II bombings of 1945 were more than historical facts that was later attributed to the miraculous doings of the MPJN. Kiapo Church, as mentioned, was burned or partially destroyed but the image remained intact. NPJN is a life-size image of Christ wearing a maroon robe, as you can see in the picture, embroiled in gold and silver with a crown of thorns and a diadem that forms three silver rays on the head. The image right shoulder rests a wooden cross, reenacting a biblical scene of Christ struggling to stand up after a fall with a face manifesting pain and suffering. The complexion is black with human, real human hail. The exact date when the image was transferred to Kiapo Church is still debatable. It was very likely that a replica was made to substitute the image enshrined in Intramuros, which existed until it was destroyed during Second World War. Filipino historians are arguing that the original 16th century image was the one transferred in Kiapo. But there are records saying that before the sacred burning of Kiapo on January 15, 1791, the transferring of the image took place. It was also assumed that the image was moved to Quiapo just a few years before the said date, most probably 1767. This is in line that the image was transferred to Quiapo Church following the order of Basilio Sancho de Santa Justa. Sancho de Santa Justa was Manila Archbishop from April 14, 1766 to December 15, 1787. So it is also safe to assume that the transfer was probably between 1767 and 1787. Sancho de Santa Justa was replaced by Juan Antonio Orbigo de Gallego on December 15, 1788. Gallego was Archbishop Manila until May 17, 1797. Before 2007, the traditional January 9 procession was called Pasan, a Tagalog word for carrying because originally the image was placed in a carriage designed to be carried on the shoulders. Before the wheeled carriage was used, the image was carried in procession in the streets of Quiapo district. In 2009, the Tagalog term salia became popular. The word is from pagsalya, which means to pull, because the current carriage or andas are now wheeled and pulled by a pair of 50-meter ropes. For many devotees, the rope is a symbolic extension of MPJN's cross. Although historically correct, the term traslacion, which means the transferring of the image from Bagumbayan to Quiapo, the term only was introduced in 2007. That year was the 400 years anniversary of the arrival of the image from Mexico to the Philippines. Jose Clemente Ignacio was, has popularized the term translation. He was the parish priest and rector of Gapu Church during the 400 years celebration. When Monsignor Hernando Coronel was appointed rector of Gapu Church in 2015, he continued the translation from Laneta to Quiapo and started the live streaming of masses. The online initiative of Coronel became more popular during the COVID-19 lockdown. 
currently the virtual presence of Kiapo Church on Facebook has 3.5 million followers. The YouTube channel of the Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene has more than 220,000 subscribers. In Kiapo, performing sacred vow or PSB means two things. First, it is both physical and virtual. It connects the experiences of the devotees in performing their panata by highlighting the interplay of the events and objects. Second, it is used by the devotees and HDN members as a metaphor for gratitude and reciprocity or the reciprocal process happening to return the favor or debt of gratitude to NPJN. The following slides, I will discuss the role of objects, actors, as well as the notion of pamumwesto and kumotacho to understand PSB in Quiapo. In Quiapo, the presence of sacred object is an important aspect to understand the religious reality of the devotees. It presupposes the image of NPJN is the center of their PSB. And while the devotees are reenacting their PSB, they are using a picture or replica of MPGen that has been placed by holy water, blessed by holy water. For many of the devotees, this picture or replica is not ordinary object, not the ephemeral but sacred object that they can keep in place in their family or home altar. According to a scholar, Dietri de la Cruz, objects from sacred sites are proofs of a most material sort, witnessed and pressed by not just by one, but by many. So the blessing received by the objects and by them can also be shared or transferred to the whole family or community. Sacred objects, according to another scholar, Julius Bautista, whether as souvenirs or for veneration, portrays a kind of transportability of spiritual energy inherent in the religious material culture. The presence of sodalities, confraternities, and other forms of Catholic lay associations is another important feature of PSB. They are crucial in the transmission and continuation of the devotional practices. Sodalities or confraternities, also known as brotherhood, were medieval phenomena that originated from European Catholic communities. Of fraternities and brotherhoods became popular in Latin American colonies of space, including the Philippines. Many confraternities in the Philippines had undergone modifications over time. This study focuses on the Quiapo based brotherhood of Hijos del Nazareno or HDN. The discussion on the Catholic lay association addresses the importance of lay actors to the growth and the devotion to Christ in the Philippines. As of 2021, there are six HDN officially recognized in Quiapo. HDN are organized in different balangays of chapters. HDN renew their membership every feast day of Christ the King. While Quiapo was able to conduct their religious activities remotely, most churches in Manila were caught off guard to continue their activities online. During the lockdown, Quiapo Church used social media to reach out to their parishioners and regularly upload news and information. The church reinforced the live broadcast of all masses on Facebook and launched a YouTube channel for live stream of all religious activities. Although the usual religious or ritual practices of many of the devotees, such as attending uh, everyday mass and the Friday devotion was suspended, PSB at home or in a specific space or puesto is proven also to be effective. One may not touch the sacred image physically, but through the screen, according to many devotees, they can catch a glimpse or gaze of MPJN. While online masses and ritual devotion at home is not the same level as going to a church physically, 
online streaming of masses and other religious activities provided continuity of PSB. In Quiapo, PSB generates meaning through the interaction of the physical and the virtual space. PSB as pumumuesto or placing of the self is a ritual process that narrates the devotee's religious experience. The experiences and the stories of many devotees were told and shared in different ways and are based on first, how they are performing their religious devotions to NPJN, second, how they are interacting with other devotees and introduce their devotion to non-Catholics. And third, how the different uh, historical accounts are incorporated into the formation of the devotees' sense of space. In this study, the use of the Tagalog word pamumuesto or puesto is similar to the Spanish word puesto which means place or position. For many Tagalog communities, puesto is also synonymous to sacred places in nature like mountains, river, caves, trees, or even waterfalls. While pumumuesto is performed according to tradition or puesto to puesto or place to place, in Quiapo, the placing of self in the physical and ritual space is a ritual act. The practice of pamumesto in Quiapo has three important components. First, God or MPJN as the source of power and blessings. Number two, the devotee or receiver of power or blessings. And last, the space or the puesto. PSB as pamumesto is how devotees are making temporary homes for themselves for others, and to MPJN. Many devotees build their own homes within a larger community, seeing themselves as religious beings dwelling in a place as well as crossing in space. And their final destination is to return to the sacred. Through their practice of pamumwesto, devotees are overcoming not only the boundaries of the physical space, they're also joining the other devotees either from the same communities or from the other places virtually. And for them to be able to PSB, they are likewise sharing the place and space with the people who govern them. For example, the elders in their family, community or group who guides them on the proper expression of their devotions or religious practices. Before the pandemic, Quiapo Church was able or already known no, for its virtual activities through live streaming. As mentioned earlier, the two main platforms used by the church is Facebook and YouTube. Although the majority of the devotees describe that online masses is better than nothing at all and that the social distancing and religious bubble to some extent help in controlling the spread of the virus, but a good number of them noted that the internet cannot really replace the expression in, of receiving the Eucharist and attending other religious activities in person. In Quiapo, PSB is distinctive in showing the devotee's kalooban or innermost selfhood. The devotee's sense of self is connected to his or her sense of space. The space occupied by the devotees could be the actual site for PSB or a substitute sacred site. The practice of visiting a substitute sacred site is known as komotacho. The idea is for pilgrims or devotees who could not go to Jerusalem for whatever reason could make the pilgrimage to Rome and receive all the same blessing. Here, Rome is an example as a substitute place for Jerusalem. Alternatively, if pilgrims or devotees could not make it to Jerusalem or Rome, a local church could be a substitute. The term komotacha is from a Latin word for exchange or substitution. In Quiapo, the practice of substituting a sacred site is part of the new normal 
of religious activity due to COVID-19 pandemic. Kumatacha is both collective and personal. While virtual PSB has a collective aspect through ritual practice in an imagined community, it is also a personal journey, a way for devotees to construct their own paths for PSB. In Quiapo, PSB is not simply substituting the physical sites or the physical sacred sites, no? but also about the virtual space the devotee is occupying. It is not just about viewing and looking at the screen, but also encountering others virtually. It is performative imagining and transporting the mind of the devotees to the sacred. It is imagining NPJN and reenacting their PSB in the actual sacred site, which is Kiapo Church. The historical development of Kiapo Church including you know, the, the narratives of the pandemic, the miracle stories and tales of miraculous survival, as well as the episodes of the transferring and returning of the image of MPJN may in fact be some of the most significant events in the growth of the devotion to Christ no? and how it has changed over time. In Kiapo, performing pananta either personal or inherited occupy a singular importance among the devotees and HDN members. A large number of them view PSB as an act of returning the favor or utang na loob to MPJN. It is also a form of sacrifice, tiis, magtiis, whether their prayers or petition are granted or not. What is important for them is for their PSB to be fulfilled either as a lifetime commitment or can be passed on to the next generation or any member of the extended family. In Kiapo, PSB is unique in showing the devotee's innermost selfhood or kalooban. PSB is about sharing of space with other devotees. It is symbolic and performative. During PSB, the interplay of the bodily gestures the texts, words, and objects are believed to convey the messages of the essential truths of the devotee's actions. While it raises the issues regarding the relationship between the physical and virtual, PSB for many devotees is an affected ritual practice. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Taliara. It was a very enlightening discourse, as usual. And we are opening the floor now for the questions in the, in the open forum. Um, we are monitoring the chat box in our Zoom room. But I have been sent some questions already, no? And this is the first one. Uh, we are so curious to know how Dr. Tagliara was fascinated by uh, the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno because his fellow plenary speaker, Professor Chao Chuan, mentioned that he was attracted to the scholarship of the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno by his own mother's devotion that as a child he would be taken by his mother to the Kiapo Church for the Pananta. So may we know, Dr. Tagliara, what attracted you to do your scholarship for the Black Nazareth? All right, uh, can you hear me? Can someone say yes? All right, thank you so much po, Professor Galang Pereña. Uh, firstly po, uh, pasalamat po ako sa mga organizer ng uh, uh, research forum na ito no uh, ka, kung sasagutin ko po yung uh, tanong uh, baka po magugulat kayo na hindi po ako kamukha Ay naririnig niyo na po ba ako ah, Dr. Mark Yes 
Can we hear? Can you hear me? So, what are we going to do? Can you hear me, po? Wait, lang po. Doctor Taliara, at uh, in a little while, we're trying to sort out the technical difficulties. Lang po. Are you in Kalumpit, Doctor Taliara? Ah, uh, yes. Are you in Kalumpit? Yes, I'm in Bulacan. <laughs> Thumbs up. Ah, okay. So, side down po nyo, Dr. Tanyara, is the difficulty. Wait lang pa. We're sorting out the glitch. Tinatanong po ko nasa kalumpit si Dr. Mark kasi mag-ahay ako sa mami niya. Kaya ka, Agnes. Siguro po doon sa chat box, doon sa mga audience na nakakarinig sa akin, maaari po mag-yes. Ah, yes na po! Congratulations! Finally, we have the audio. Ayan. Sino po ba yung first question? Ayan. Okay, sasagutin ko na po yung uh, unang question. No? Um, wala po akong kamukhang uh, uh, masasabing... Uh, Uh, doon sa nabanggit po ni Professor Chua. Uh, ordinary po akong uh, uh, devotee kung titingnan nyo before ako mag-research sa Quiapo o sa Nazareno. Estudyante rin po ako sa Manila, nagtrabaho rin po ako sa Manila at uh, kamukha ng mga nabanggit in, in, la, kahapon, uh, nagsisimba at nag, uh, uh, napapadaan din po ako sa Quiapo, no? Pero yung aking pong uh, talagang interest sa pag-research uh, is religion. Actually, comparative religious studies po. No? Uh, kung titignan nyo po, ang uh, training ko is uh, sa philosophy uh, at saka po sa cultural ethnography. Uh, na, nagkaroon po ko ng matinding interest po sa Quiapo o sa devotion ng uh, Uh, Nasareno is uh, dahil sa malaking uh, uh, ambag nito. No? Uh, hindi lang dun sa in, na, magiging interesado ka kung bakit ang mga tao ay nagpupunta. No? Kundi dun sa uh, pangkahalatang uh, ideya no? ng uh, pananampalataya ng mga Pilipino. Ngayon, uh, nung nagtatrabaho po ako sa Manila, Uh, konektado rin po sa media at uh, meron din po sa akademiko napag-isip-isip ko po nung nag-propose ako sa aking um, uh, dissertation o PhD sa Singapore um, ng Southeast Asian Studies uh, sabi ko katolisismo no? sa Southeast Asia uh, but uh, syempre sa sobrang laki po ng uh, ang, uh, uh, area of coverage mas inuna ko po yung sa Pilipinas. Ngayon, sinadjust din po sa akin kung ano po yung uh, most significant no? uh, religious or Catholic uh, devotion that, that could be uh, the main focus of my dissertation. Natapos ko po yung dissertation ko uh, noong 2018, pero nagsimula po ako mag-research as early as uh, 2013 or before pa po nung uh, uh, ma-introduce yung tinatawag na Traslasyon. Kasi nung panahon po na nabanggit ko at yung ibang mga tao na nagsalita dito na yung pagpunta natin sa Quiapo, uh, pagdaan uh, natin sa Quiapo, yung taon-taon na prosesyon na iniintay natin, eh, tinatawag na lokal, no? uh, Quiapo procession lang po yon Nagkaroon ng significant no? ng uh, pagbabago na aking ina-argue rin po noong uh, na-introduce yung Uh, 20, na introduce sa 2017 or 2016 yung um, traslasyon. Na sabi nga po ni uh, 
Professor Chu Wai could be only one time in line with the celebration no, of the arrival of the image together with the record letters in 1606. Pero uh, natuloy po siya no? uh, na magsimula no? doon sa Luneta na binanggit ko doon sa aking uh, presentasyon na isa sa mga historical sites na talagang konektado doon sa tamang uh, pag uh, re enact ng no, tinatawag na translation. Kaya na at na at napagtuloy-tuloy din po ito uh, mula noon na hindi na naibalik, nagkaroon lang po ng uh, cancellation because do sa pandemic natin. No, so yung interest po is more academic uh, pero syempre po sinuportahan siya nung uh, pagiging ordinaryong devotee ko po at wala ri, wala naman po talagang uh, masasabi nating uh, Uh, miraculous directly no Mer may maari pong meron baka po hindi ko lang po na uh, re-realize pa pero uh, ang dominante po ngayon is yung sa aking interest at na re na reinforce po siya doon sa aking uh, uh, pagpili no ng uh, natatamang uh, topic no sa aking PhD dissertation na pwede rin po masabi natin na Pasalamat na rin po sa Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno na natapos ko po siya no? sa apat na taon na uh, pagre-research at na-depend ko po siya successfully in 2018. Salamat po at base po sa inyong tugon, Dr. Mark, parang providential talaga ang inyong pag-aaral sa Black Nazarene. Parang hinihilan niya talaga <laughs> kayo sa direksyon niya. It's very good to know. Now, the second question actually is related to what you have mentioned as your methodology in your study of the Black Nazarene. You have mentioned that you use the historical and ethnographic uh, method. Uh, because my students who are watching right now no, from Arts and Letters of USD are really interested to know how you did this Uh, approach or methodology using historical and the graphic methodology. Uh, in a nutshell, po, kasi, uh, they, are, they will be doing their thesis soon or their undergraduate thesis. They're in their sophomore year now. Next year, gawa na sila ng thesis proposal. And they are interested to know paano daw po ba ginagawa itong methodology na ito, which you use in the study. of the Black Nazarene. Dr. Mark. Salamat po sa tanong, uh, Professor Galang Pereño po. Uh, I think tamang-tama po yan, ano? kasi uh, nag-struggle po lahat ng researcher ngayong pandemic, no? especially coming nasa linya ng uh, ethnography no? o anthropology or even sa mga historia na kailangan pumunta sa library at archives. Paano po ba? No? Ito po yung... Um, Uh, masasuggest ko po. No? In line po ito dun sa current or yung tinuro ko po uh, this semester. No? Kasi uh, yung mga estudyante ko rin po ay uh, gumagawa ng kanilang mga research paper at some of them are doing their thesis proposal. Uh, yeah. Sa iba po kasi mga researcher, uh, maaari pong madali eh, no? na kahit na pandemic uh, through textual analysis o yung uh, online no research uh, through library uh, they can continue pero sa amin po na nag uh, anthropology being in the community being in place so katulad nito no being with the Quiapo devotees with Eos de Nazareno um uh, medyo may challenging po hindi po katulad ng pre-pandemic na um pag interview at pagkukuha ng respondent mahirap pero Uh, you can easily travel. No? Pero bago po magkaroon ng epektibong um, paraan no? Nung sa antropolohiya or yung cultural ethnography kung sa akin pong uh, specialization na pagpunta sa komunidad o pag-interview ng tao or yung tinatawag na participant observation kasi ako po ay nag-participate din po. No? Hindi lang po ako talaga nakasampa, no? doon sa andas no that is uh, too dangerous pero pag pili po ng metodolohiya katulad po ako kung napansin niyo paulit-ulit ko pong uh, nababanggit doon sa aking presentasyon yung conceptual 
tool na gusto ko pong i-anchor doon sa methodology ko. Kailangan po, isipin nyo conceptual muna na ako, ang aking main na agenda is to make sense kung totoo yung pamumwesto at kumutacho. Yung pamumwesto at kumutacho po, eh, konektado doon sa paraan ng aking uh, methodology. no Kasi uh, yung sa pamumwesto, yung space, so being in the space, being with the community, being with the people is important. So, Kung mag-i-interview kayo, kaari po, ano, at uh, ipagdasal po natin na matapos na po yung pandemic at ang mga estudyante babalik na sa kanilang campus, uh, may pag-ingat pa rin po. No? Pupunta kayo sa komunidad pero hihingi kayo ng permiso no? doon sa komunidad o sa tao na uh, kakausapin nyo. Dangerous, challenging, risky, pero party po iyan kung cultural anthropology, anthropology po kayo. Pero yung pag-iingat at pagpaplano ay kailangan-kailangan po. No? At uh, huwag kang mahiya no? na magtanong at huwag kang mahiyang yung participant observation na tinatawag po. Kung, kung talagang uh, hingin ka ng uh, request na mag-participate at kumain o sumama do sa mga grupo na Uh, gusto mong interviewin kasi makakatulong po iyon no at kahapon po nabanggit din ni uh, professor Espiritu no na yung reflexivity kasi po he, yung methodology data gathering hindi po natatapos doon kasi yung analysis po eh it in 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 sa katotohanan po it takes time no pero uh, mahalagang mahalaga po na yung during the time that you're gathering data through your methodology Uh, at saka yung uh, uh, materialis na makukuha nyo, eh, mag-document po kayo ng maayos. No? At para doon sa data gathering nyo, eh, uh, maging uh, fruitful na tinatawag po. No? Uh, marami pong mga sigurong uh, specific steps. No? Pero yung base po doon sa aking experience, uh, minsan po kasi yung mga gusto ko pong mangyari na nakalagay doon sa submitted proposal, Eh, minsan nagbabago, kailangan po sanay kayo mag-improvise, lalo na yung mga kabataan ngayon. No? Uh, pero maganda po nagsisimula kayo sa isang organisadong plano para pagdating nyo dun sa actual na uh, site, no? eh, uh, magiging mas epektibo ang pagkuha nyo ng uh, mga materyales o pag-interview. Nabanggit ko po yung challenge po. No? Kasi ngayon po, Uh, before the pandemic, malaki po yung question dun sa tinatawag na online ethnography o digital ethnography. Di ba po, kung naririnig nyo noon, parang mas maganda personal, face-to-face. Hindi naman po mawawala yun. No? Uh, nadun pa rin po yung, eka nga, yung standard na face-to-face, eh, yun pa rin ang tinatawag na uh, epektibong paraan no pero ngayon po no isa sa mga sinasabi ko sa mga estudyante ko rin po na hindi dapat mata- hindi dapat mag uh, stop no ang pagre-research kaya yung digital or online ethnography na tinatawag eh i-try nyo uh, tinry ko po syempre mahirap at may mga pag pag uh, uh, alang-alang ako na maaari bang maging lehiti mo yung mga data na makukuha ko doon sa Zoom interview ko, sa mga Google Meet interview ko, uh, doon sa pag-observe ko doon sa mga komunidad na nasa online, nasa Facebook. Kasi tandaan nyo po, kapag wala kayo doon sa physical sites, nandito lang kayo sa room nyo. Nandito lang kayo sa uh, laptop nyo, sa computer nyo. So, paano ka pupunta sa komunidad? So, ang, nag, ang nagpalit sa physical na komunidad po is yung mga komunidad online. Eh, dalawa uri po yun, no? yung online communities at saka communities online. Ang challenge po dun sa uh, mga researcher is nagiging multiple no? sites po ang dapat nilang uh, uh, obserbahan. Pero no? sa umpisa po siguro challenging as I experience it po. No? Pero kung makikita nyo po sa presentasyon ko, may mga, may mga. Uh, komunidad po ako na online na inobserbahan no? in place of the participant observation na nasa physical kasi obserbahan mo sila during the live streaming of masses kung ano yung mga comments nila and how do they interact through their chat or through their bigiging uh, comments or even emojis dun sa mga online communities meron pa rin no? so, uh, merong substitute din po dun sa physical methodology Uh, na gina, ginagawa natin through online no so ano po ang gusto kong sabihin no so um, yung experience ko po is uh, maari pong isa sa mga uh, simula no o maari pong eksperimento na 
pwede na po siguro in the future na kahit na mabalik na tayo sa normal at wala ng pandemic, may elemento pa rin more or may component pa rin po ng online ethnography. Kung questioning po yung validity ng mga materials na uh, maaring makuha sa online through interview, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or other technologically mediated uh, 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 aspect po, eh, na, is a challenge mo for all researcher. No? Uh, but uh, uh, so far po, no? may konting result na could be further uh, expanded in the future po no so sana po makatulong yon at uh, uh, advice ko lang po sa lahat ng mga estudyante is uh, uh, magplano syempre at uh, mag-isip muna ng konsepto uh, eh, although yung konsepto maaring magbago along the way at makagkaroon ng resulta based doon sa mga nakuhang uh, Uh, data or interview pero dapat meron po tayong a little bit of hypothesis para mag-guide tayo. And then, uh, huwag magtatakot na uh, magpunta no, sa komunidad at huwag matakot din gumamit ng other uh, platforms po para po magtuloy-tuloy ang ating uh, paggawa ng research. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark. And this reminds me, siguro po, dapat ma-invite namin kayo sa USD, you retrace your steps back to your alma mater para po kayo magbigay ng lecture sa ating mga estudyante. And as you have uh, elucidated, parang magkakaroon ng hybrid na paraan ng pag-research ngayon. Uh, kung sa teaching learning ay mayroong high flex ba yun na tawag natin ngayon, no? parang combined na in-person at saka online. Uh, siguro po, it will be best that you talk to our students and enlighten them some more. Now, you also talked about the conceptual framework you know, in doing research. And isa pong lumutan dun sa paper nyo, yung TSD. TSD? No? Ano nga po ba yung performing sacred vow of the TSD? No? The next question is related to this. So, in the Eucharistic celebration, the highlight is the receiving of the Holy Communion, the host, the body of Christ. When the pandemic happened, this became nearly impossible when the churches were closed for the celebration of the physical Mass. And when finally the Masses were celebrated again with IATF restrictions, there was a big change in the liturgy of the Eucharist. The act of spiritual communion now replacing the physical ritual of the Holy Communion. And the question is this, may we consider these among the TS TSB alternative in performing our sacred vow? And is this sacred in a way? So from the point of view of a scholar, though, uh, may theological background see Dr. Mark. Salamat po sa uh, question na yan. No? Uh, although nabagid niyo po, konti na naman po yung aking uh, theological uh, background. Hindi po ko theologian kung masasabi niyo po sa level po ni Professor Espiritu no? uh, na nagsalita kahapon. No? Kaya yung kanyang uh, uh, explanation is uh, towards talaga yung theological insights of that. No? So sa akin po, ang masasagot ko diyan no uh, sa liturgy no uh, inexpect ko na rin po yan ano actually um, although sinasabi ko sa sarili ko baka hindi sapat no yung aking isasagot no i could just uh, based on uh, on sa specialization ko no at uh, perhaps no doon sa pagiging uh, uh, observant ko doon sa kapwa ko deboto uh, at doon sa mga tao na nakakahalumilob ko no uh, yung uh, as nabanggit ko po doon sa presentation ko no uh, very challenging po talaga yung uh, uh, malaman kung uh, uh, talagang effective po ba o valid na tinatawag no kung liturgically speaking no uh, siguro po mga pari ang magsasabi niyan uh, pero yung effectivity po siguro po yung una yung mga unang buwan no ng lockdown uh, questionable siguro po do sa mga ordinary mga na, 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 deboto no kung effective nga po ba yung magiging altar mo ngayon 
eh yung television o yung yung laptop mo no o do sa mga na nakita ko po no in the after no a uh, uh, few months no na akala kasi natin konting buwan lang at magbabalik na tayo sa normal pero nung nagkaroon ng extension modification ng mga community quarantine lockdown so alert level uh, parang unti-unting naging naging parte na no yung laptop of television no na naging altar to the point that uh, yung mga deboto eh ginagawang uh, gumagawa no ng paraan para maging uh, sagrado Uh, no yung uh, yung small corner of the living room room or a particular space in our house no so kung sasabihin po nating sagrado uh, i think po pwede siya maging sagrado no uh, kung ginagawa mo yung pagdadasal or, or any religious uh, practices in that particular space no marami na rin po akong na cited no na na mga scholars na naggumawa niya no Uh, pero do sa physical approach po no yung kanilang mga dokumento at kanilang mga data po so do sa mga scholar na kami po no na nag uh, be bridge between the physical uh, and the virtual uh, uh, we'll try to uh, our best po to contribute to make sense of what is happening doon sa actual uh, religious practices in this hybrid no approach no uh, ang naging maganda lang po doon is may comparison talaga no na uh, pagpupunta ka sa Quiapo syempre um, nandoon yung talagang yung sa tinatawag na malakas no na attraction no yung malakas na dating sa iyo no na magpunta doon at pagkatapos ng misa o pag nobena or pag hawak doon sa poon na sereno no sa pagpila Uh, may fulfillment po no doon sa naman po sa online na nasa bahay ka at nanonood ka sa television uh, based do sa mga na interview ko sa umpisa wala no parang hindi nila ma maramdaman no yung tinatawag kung sa kung theologically or liturgically speaking validity no kasi nga pa, pa, nasanay tayo na hihingi ng ng na Eucharist no at uh, ang 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 pare o o mga eucharistic minister nagbibigay sa iyo in a physical site ito wala no at binabanggit mo no hindi naman to pagkakataon po na nangyari noon i'm sure uh, during the earlier uh, 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 time of the, the the tradition no yung sa history of the church maari pong ginagamit din tong uh, eucharistic prayer no maaring uh, doon din po sa mga pandemic na suspend ng ang ating uh, uh, pag-attend at pagbisita sa Uh, simbahan o do sa mga mayroong lugar na limitado lang no ang uh, pagsisimba no so uh, para po sa akin majority doon sa mga na interview ko effective po no at pwede siyang maging uh, sacred site to the point nga po na ko ang dati ang living room o yung room po is naging purely secular at parang hindi unholy no ang tinatawag na nangyayari doon uh, yung yung particular one hour one and a half no of attending a mass or particular religious uh, activities online nagiging sagrado naging matahimik nagiging uh, parang uh, uh, mayroong pagbabago doon sa small corner of the house no na to the point na dahil nagiging regular yon no especially those who are uh, attending mass online in a daily basis um meron po silang napansin na nagiging hindi siya nagkakaroon siya ng pagkakaiba no kumpara doon sa pre-pandemic na living room lang siya, room lang siya, no? Pero ito because of the screen being a substitute altar, no? To the actual altar in the church, eh meron siyang uh, uh, nagkakaroon ng uh, uh, religious, no? Dimension o yung aura ng dimension sa kanyang uh, lugar, no? So, maari pong uh, uh, sa theological and liturgical speaking Uh, medyo wala ako masasagot directly yung validity na sinasabi ko yung valid sa mga deboto para sa kanila uh, maaring valid din po sa mga liturgists natin o sa mga theologian natin o mga pari natin pero based po doon sa aking participant observation at sa mga data na nakuha ko uh, although masakit sabihin na sinasabi is better than nothing pero uh, it seems that na, na natatanggap no ng uh, mga deboto o ng mga katolikong na kausap ko yung uh, virtual format na nangyayari sa atin. Yung iba nga po no to the point dagdag ko lang po maaring hindi to kasama doon 
yung sa Pilipinas po kasi yon maraming question, maraming dapat pang itanong at marami pang dapat obserbahan kasi hindi lang po uh, two years tayong lockdown, no? two years tayong mayroong modify, may, may konti, mayroong uh, limited capacity pero to the point na madaming na stuck doon sa bahay ng two years no without attending uh, physical mass. No? So yung epekto noon na uh, Malalaman pa po natin no siguro kapag uh, nag-normalize tayo yung mga result po na na-present namin ngayon at iba doon sa mga gumagawa rin po ng uh, uh, analysis on this virtual format on religious practices not only in Catholics no but also uh, other religious groups no and other uh, Christian denominations eh maari po meron pang uh, analysis na lalabas diyan pero doon po sa mga Pilipinos abroad na kahit po hindi pa po pandemic no especially sa mga bansa na wala talagang Catholic church no or you have to travel long distance ginagawa na nila yon no uh, for them it's already valid this is a way for them to really continue what they uh, are doing no and noon sa Pilipinas na reinforce lang siya and most probably uh, mas na motivated yung mga deboto abroad o yung mga Pilipino Catholics na abroad na Uh, kung wala talagang chance ang maka-attend ng misa do sa isang bansa na walang uh, minority ang Catholicismo, Christianity, no? Eh mag online tayo, no? So, uh, may 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 mayroon pong pagbabago, no? So, yung pong sagot ko, no? Maari pong open-ended, pero I hope na uh, makatuloy ding tipo ito no? para ma- magkaroon pa ng uh, mas maraming analysis, no? Sa susunod na mga uh, panahon po. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark. Parang time will tell, no? Marami pa pong pumapasok na questions, pero limited na po ang time. Pero just to conclude and uh, parang tie up into a neat package the open forum on Dr. Mark's presentation, one last question. Uh, this is Pagtanaw versus Pahalik, no? So, maipapalagay po ba na tagumpay ang Pagtanaw sa pagpapatuloy ng devotion sa Nazareno? May inumukali ba na maaari itong pamalit sa tradisyon ng pahalit? Very briefly po, Dr. Mark, paano kaya? Mm-hmm. Uh, siguro po ang management ng uh, uh, kaya po no? ang uh, magpa-final decision yan. Sa, uh, sa akin po, no? base sa aking observasyon no? at uh, actual uh, a participant observation nung isang araw po nandoon ako na no, sa Quiapo at bumisita ako sarado pa rin no yung uh, linya yung pagpila kasi pumipila po ako talaga doon sa pag pag uh, 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 hawak no doon sa ating uh, uh, poong na sareno sa altar no sarado pa rin no so um, kung susunod po tayo kasi sa sa batas no iniiwasan pa rin, ini-encourage pa rin na uh, limitahan pa rin. No? Kahit na tumataas ang kapasidad, uh, nagpagpasok sa isang lugar, sa mga simbahan at uh, any uh, gathering spaces, no? e, may chance pa rin po no? na maaaring magalit no? yung batas. No? Kaya maaari pong uh, kung in the next few months at mag, talagang magtuloy-tuloy, no? Uh, sa biyaya ng Diyos na mag-normalize na uh, o gradual po no ang uh, dapat uh, gawin. Maari po sa aming mga researchers sa uh, humanities and social uh, medyo may pagka-radical no sabing tuloy or hindi tuloy no baka po sa mga medical experts sa scientists sabi nila na mag-ingat pa rin. Pero yung sa ating pong side no yung mga researchers sa atin may substitute na pwedeng gawin katulad ng patanaw no. Uh, para po sa akin affected po siya no kasi do sa akin presentation no yung cent- yung centrality of the sacred object in particular uh, the image of NPJ and by the way po marami akong uh, acronym diyan no SPSB tsaka NPJN no I, I I I like to introduce acronyms to to the younger audience too so that they can uh, remember no so yung centrality of uh, objects no uh, Nakasentro po siya syempre do sa actual image of the NPJN no kung ilalabas mo nga po siya just to the balcony no yung impact pa rin po noon is uh, malaki pa rin no uh, kaya na nararamdaman ko kasi yung paggaze po no may tinatago ako gazing diyan eh no yung pagtining nyo kasi napansin ko po sa inside pag pumasok kayo sa Kiapo Church ang mga tao talagang ang mata uh, doon kagad sa altar eh doon sa imahen po di ba at minsan nagtataas pa po ng kamay parang respeto no 
So yung pag po is a fulfillment no of their simple panata. It could not be the full PSB, the annual procession, the Friday devotion, uh, or other no connected uh, PSB. No? Pero yung kanilang tinatawag na uh, uh, pagdalaw doon, sa sariling pagdalaw at pagtanaw, no? eh, maaari pong magandang substitute po. Kasi kung hindi, hindi pa po natin siguro maibabalik ma- Uh, kahit na gradually mag uh, level ang ang alert level natin sa pinakamababa baka hindi pa po kagad magprosesyon maari po yung prosesyon yung ginagawa ngayon no na nakaikot at, at, at limited space lang no pero yung massive na tinatawag na rin translation or even doon lang sa Quiapo district baari pong maaring di pa no kaya yung alternatibo no uh, na maaring gawin is yun muna no na para continuous no ang ang uh, ang uh, motivation ng mga devotee na na pumunta sa Quiapo kung may pagkakataon or uh, matanaw no uh, in just passing no doon sa road or mga kali or mga streets na maaring mapunta nila sa Quiapo no so para sa akin po Uh, epektibo din po siya kasi eh, in continuity no of the devotion in another format no uh, nandoon nga lang po sa altar parang ang kutiting niyo i know i know it's a replica no ang naka uh, lagay do sa balcony pero para siyang in yung movement of a sacred object to the altar all the way to another uh, corner of that sacred space kasi kung titingnan niyo po ang Quiapo is considered a sacred space for many no although syempre may secular space siya no pero pag sinabing Quiapo yes, it seems that majority of the devotees are talking about sacredness no para sa akin po no yung pag-iisip ng alternatibo is uh, the way to go muna po no para may continuity and then gradually or hopefully maibalik natin siguro sa Quiapo muna before we move to a massive and big event going to Luneta uh, doon sa translation natin, no? Our heads, our hearts are overflowing with gratitude. So, napakaganda po ninyong discourse. So, at bago mo kayo pakawalan, uh, please extend the USD Group's uh, thanks to Dr. Fernando Sanchago, who is Director of the Villasal Research, no? Southeast Asia Research Center Hub. Kasi dyan po tayo nagpangita at dyan na buo ang ating uh, magandang pagsasamahan. So lalo nag-talk kayo sa research and we were invited by Dr. Sanchago. Hi, sir. Uh, and now, may we call on Monsignor Nando Coronel to award the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Sanchago. Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene, St. John the Baptist Parish, Quiapo, Manila, awards this plaque of appreciation to Assistant Professor Mark Inigo M. Talyara, De La Salle University. Understanding Catholicism in Shared Space for Religious Practices. An Analysis of performing sacred vow to Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno of Quiapo for being a plenary lecturer during the first National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene with the team, 500 years of journey with the Black Nazarene devotion and discourse held on March 16, 17, 2022 via Zoom virtual video conferencing. Signed, Reverend Monsignor Hernando Coronel, Lead Convener. Maraming salamat po. And now, with a much-awaited special feature of this conference, which is a roundtable discussion on the unparalleled devotion to the Black Nazarene, and to be moderated by two esteemed colleagues from USD, Dr. Roberto Belara Antilo is now the chair of the Department of Filipino PSD, and Dr. Luciana Lopez Orchola, formerly chair of the Department of Literature and Humanities. Ang tawag ko po dito sa RTV na dito ay talk show nila. Ito ay magpapakashow ko sa ngayon. So may I call on Professor Orchola, uh, Professor Orchola, to introduce the members of the panel. Magandang umaga po ulit. 
Kahapon ay nakinig tayo ng mga akademikong diskurso na isinulat at ibinahagi ng mga paper presenters na binubuo ng guro, scholar, mananaliksik at laiko. Sa mga naisulat nilang papel, karaniwan na ang diskurso ay nakaugat sa karanasan ng diboto na ukol sa dipusyon sa mahal na poong Jesus Nazareno. Ngayon po ay aming ipalalabas ang isang kakaibang segment ng konferensyang ito. Ang roundtable discussion na binubuo ng papel na maghahatid ng kanilang karanasan yung raw experiences po nila na masasabing tunay na halimbawa ng witnessing. Pakinggan po natin ang mga membro ng ating panel, isang dibotong ina, si Sister Lilibeth Bautista, isang kabataang na deboto, si Lawrence, si Lance Raven Chato, isang mamamasan, si Brother Juanito Tan Jr., at isang community events organizer, si Mark Joseph Verdadero. Magandang umaga po mga kapatid sa pananampalataya. Welcome sa ating roundtable discussion kasama ang mga diboto sa poong Nazareno. Ako po si Associate Professor Luz Orquiola na bumabati ng isang makabuluhang araw para sa kalahok ng First National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene. Kasama ko po si Professor Robert Ampil, katuwang na moderator para sa roundtable discussion nababati rin at magpapakilala ng kalahok sa roundtable discussion. Padayon, isang mapagpalang araw sa ating lahat, sa mga diboto, mga kasamang kalahok, sa unang pambansang komperensya hinggil sa pag-aaral ng Sapuong Nasareno. Madlang manunood, madlang nakikiisa sa pananampalataya. Sa ilang sandali lamang ay sisimulan na natin ang ating panayam sa mga diboto. Ikinagagala ko pong ipakilala ang mga miyembro ng panel. Si Kapatid Juanito Tan Jr., 36 na taong gulang, may asawa, apat na anak, nakatira sa Anyo Antipolo Tundo. Siya po ay isang mamamasa ng 24 na taon at ihos ng 14 na taon. 12 taon siya na magsimula maging diboto. Isang negosyante, ng, at may-ari ng motor shop sa New Antipolo. Ang ikalawa naman natin panel ay si kapatid na Mark Joseph Verdadero, 36 na taon, binata mula sa Novaliches, Quezon City. Siya naman po ay event or organizer, secretariat at communication. Siya ay nagsimula maging deboto noong 2008. Kapatid, ang pangatlong miyembro ng roundtable discussion ay si Lilibet Bautista, full-time housewife, ngunit dating naging sari-sari store operator. 57 years old at siya ngayon ay presidente ng Handmaids of the Black Nazarene, naglilingkod sa Minor Basilica ng Quiapo since 2004. At ang panghuling Miyembro ng ating roundtable discussion ay ang ating dibotong youth, si Lance Raven Chato, 23 years old, graduating student ng National Teachers College, kumukuha ng kursong Bachelor of Science in Information Technology. Siya ay naglingkod sa murang edad na walong taong gulang lamang at uh, miyembro ng simbahan since 2007. Kapatid na Luz, simulan na natin ang ating panayam sa ating mga uh, deboto. Salamat, Brother Robert. Ang unang tanong sa bawat membro ng panel na ito ay hinggil sa pangyayaring naglapit sa kanila sa poong nasareno. Karamihan sa atin ay may personal na dahilan na nagbukas ng daan upang mabuo ang deposyon sa kanya. Ang tanong, anong pangyayari sa buhay ninyo ang naging daan upang maging deboto ng poong Nazareno. Uh, ako po ay si Brother Toto, ang miyembro ko ng Kiyos ng Nazareno Central at ang mamahala ng Barangay Central. Nagkumusap po ako bilang uh, isang mga masal na 
dahil sa ano na rin na magulang, si yung aking mga magulang ay kibotan ko ng kong uh, sasasaya, ano ako sa'yo, eh, kung kumihana yung uh, pag-iisang kiboto. Ngayon, eh, paano ko napasok sa simulaan dahil uh, sino po ako nung kasaray nyo dahil uh, declaring sa aking uh, pamilya, sa aking mga anak, dahil yung mga anak ko yung talaga sa akin din. Talagang uh, ito yung ano eh. Ito yung sumakas na sa ano ko nun, uh, sa pangalan ko na talagang uh, hindi ko makakain kung bakit uh, sa ganyan din niya, inaralan na siya yung mga ganyan sa akin. Kaya ang pinawa ko po nun, lumapit po ko sa nasaray, no? makikip po ko din sa pangalik dahil na nabukuyan ako. Isino po po kayo ano ko. Yung pangalik ko na isino po sa kanya na huwag na bang kahirapan. Kung kahirapan na eh, kunin niya na. Kung yung pagkakatiwala niya sa akin, pinapangako po magiging po ako. Yun po yung isang paraan na kaya nandito po ako ngayon na naglilingod sa kong si Sasaray kasi tinitilig niya yung aking kahilingan, yung aking lalangin para sa aking mga anak, sa aking pamilya. Um, Sister Beth, uh, may personal na pinagdaanan ka ba? Hinata ka ba ng uh, puon para maglingkod sa kanya? Opo, kasi yung sa aking pangalan ko ay Sunday case na sa akin. Naduwa na ako lang sa 13 years old mas. Pero sa murang edad, 13 years old pa lang, natapuan na siya. Kahit lulu, nakamong nato na isang kaitin ko si Mo, na nagpupisa ko sa sa kanyang pista ko yung hanggang panatulit, sa kanyang tulit ka rin na naman na first operation. Tapos po, kaya kung nagdala ako dito sa Piyako, wala pa po isang taon, medyo nungwa po yung mata. Tapos na po, naapiyaro na naman siya. So, kaya ko na naman po siya po. Kaya, kaya nanganata po ako na nagdasal. Na, na sana, kumali kasi nga natin yung dito po. Sinig naman po ako talaga devoto dati ng mga nangyayon. Kung doon na nagsisipan po ako, pero hindi po ako napunta ng kaya ko. Pero kung magkasakit siyong anak ko, doon po po na hindi po po rin alam na nagdala ako ng pakakumutuloy. Hindi sa sumakay lang po ako ng sasakyan. Tapos po, sabi niya, kaya ko, hindi ka, magkasal ka. Ito din nata ako, may kapaon naman po ng January 8, 2004, na nakikita ko po yung mga tao, dinadala po ka tayo yung mga sarayin sa tuloy, ay yung tayo na yung game na, 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 na sumapay kami. Yung 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 tayo na yung lahat sa amin na yung ako gusto mo, na, sa amin na sa amin sa amin. Kaya po, of course, na nasinatihan po po ng organization ng game. Salamat, Sister Beth, sa pag-share ng iyong karanasan. Napakaraming deboto na makaka mailulugar ang kanilang sarili sa iyong pinagdaanan. Pakinggan naman natin si Brother Oter. Bali ako naman ay simpleng ano lang, naiaya lang sa kaibigan. Kahit sa work, ako po ay barista dati, ay bartender. Siyempre, ang beauty ko namin ay eh, hindi eh, ka po kung nakakauwi, no? Mga magaling araw na. Minsan, pag first Friday, kayayakin kami yan kung basta kahira namin na magsimba kami kahit na sinasimba. Magsisimba po ako yan. Hanggang sa natuloy-tuloy po kung simba ko ng magaling araw, hanggang sa review yung wire, hanggang sumali ako ng wire yung Sakyaku Church, doon po na sa'yo ang aking devosyon na tumakanta ako sa Sakyaku Church. Pero, pinihiling ako doon na alala ko. Gusto ko na po mag-upload, hindi ko sa kanya. Parang ilang buwan lang po nakapagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpagpag
ito ba yung cost niya? So, kung gano'y po, ako na po ay MDM na tiyan. So, from volunteer, part-timer, ngayon po, hindi uh, lang sa pahit, kundi MDM na po ako ng tiyan. Kasi ito po sa tiyan po. Ako sila sa ating tapos, may previous po sa tiyan po, but may tiyan po. May tiyan po ako ng mga sa Iba-iba ang background ng miyembro ng roundtable discussion na ito. Iba-iba rin ang kanilang karanasan, ngunit isang daan lamang ang kanilang tinahak, ang daan patungo sa poong Nazareno. Moving on to our roundtable discussion, we are ready for the second question, Brother Robert. Maraming salamat, si Sir Luz. Para, ta para naman sa susunod nating tanong, ay, ito ay para kay Brother Otep at Brother Toto. Mm, dalawang taon na na walang translasyon dahil sa pandemya. Sa translasyon daw, kasi nakatutok ang pananampalataya ng mga deboto. Kung wala ang taunang prosesyon, nawawala ang mga deboto sa sirkulasyon. Ikaw na isang namamahala sa translasyon. 
ano ang danas at observation mo sa dalawang beses na hindi pinayagan ang prosesyon. Gaano katotoo na kapag walang prosesyon, humihina ang devosyon. Halos dalawang taon na nga na walang mas-mas-mas yun yung pag-ipat niya na narelo, narelo, bigate namin na lutena, kaya-kaya. Dalawang taon na walang prosesyon, dalawang taon na walang prosesyon, Pilih ko lang lagi ko sa mga mga bayo bayo para lamang na makapagpahinga para lamang na nagmila yung mga mga na devote-devote na may kuduro ang Diyos sa pagkakatuloy. May kuduro sa atin na dati yung kasiyasyon tayo yung malapit sa Diyos. Tayo yung pinakabila ang Diyos. Pilih siya yung kalapitan yung makakapal. Pero sa panahon ng ito, ang dito niya, balik na balik na niya. Ayan. So, nagkaroon ng inovasyon sa devosyon. Tama. Yung sa karanasan naman bilang sa Diyos, yung talagang hindi natin, hindi naging hadlang yan eh. Hindi naging hadlang yung pandemya, yung COVID sa aming pananampalatay. Pagkos, mas lalo pa na aming nakilala. At mas lalo pa na aming napalari yung aming devosyon, yung aming pananampalatay. Na hindi na pala dyan sa pagpunta tuwing translasyon, malaharap na papasan, Uh, at sa anda, sa halik sa buon, hindi lang pala doon. Kasi dito, minulat kami, minulat kami sa isang landas na kailangan natin mag-ilay naman sa araw niya, sa araw mismo nung ating pag-indibusyon, yung mga sinasabi ng translation, doon eh. Nung makikita na hindi lang pala doon sa isang bagay na eh, kailangan ka mag-sacrifice yung doon taon doon eh, kumapasar ka, taon doon umakad ka sa anda, taon doon sumasil ka, hindi eh. Ngayon, ginawa ng Diyos, ginawa ng Diyos sa sarili na pag nilayan mo, palalimong ngayon para ng palatayan sa pamamagitan naman ng pagdarasal sa loob ng bahay, pamilya na lang namin, for example, sa dami-dami nung nakabalita na nagkaroon ng COVID, di ba? Ako sa awal ng Diyos, eh, talaga nagpapasalam po sa pungsi sa sarili na, na isa sa amin, walang magkasakit, hindi tinapuan ng ganong uh, karamdaman. Yun lang isang malaking uh, blessing na sa amin at mas malaking uh, para ng palatayan at umaga. Yung para ng palatayan ko, hindi sa akin eh. Na alam ko na, hindi man ako, hindi kami nakatagay yung translasyon, hindi kami tumugunong malangat dahil sa gawa ng pandemya. Eh, nag-genshot ka sa amin namin at ginagabayan na kami sa araw-araw. Yung pag-alaktaw. Kasi kami yung mismo, mga devoto, gumawa kami ng para para mabili yung translasyon. Hindi man dito sa kaya po, pagkos ginawa namin sa bawat bahay namin. Oh, mag mag maganda yung nabanggit mo, no? Brother Toto, yung nagkaroon ng uh, iba't ibang kaparaanan ang pagsamba, ang devosyon. Subalit ang tanong natin, eh, sa palagay mo, saan kumukuha ng lakas yung mga deboto? Siguro yun, 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 yung uh, kung saan kumukuha ng lakas, yun yung uh, pinagpukutan namin ng pananampalataya, yung pong si Sasarelo. Kasi hindi, uh, hindi naging uh, biro yung uh, ating uh, naranasan niya dahil hindi niya. Kung saan kami kumukuha ng lakas, eh talagang sa kanya lang kami kumapit. Hindi man natuloy yung prosesyon na yan, kasi hindi lang naman tinasusukat eh, yung aming pananampalataya. Hindi nasusukat sa prosesyon, sa translation, kundi yung uh, kasama namin siya sa araw-araw. Yun po yung uh, aming uh, sukatan. O follow up ko lang na tanong, no? uh, nabanggit mo kanina yung mga pahalik, yung pagpunas. ba diba sabi natin, kung walang nagsisimba, walang prosesyon, Walang pahalik, walang ganito. So, paano nabubuhay yung asosasyon ninyo na mamamasan? Hindi sa amin kasi, uh, ginagawa pa rin namin yung way kung aming pag-date ko. Kaya sa natin yung kaya kung mga nakakangapan din, napupunta pa rin kami. Pupunta pa rin kami para mapakita natin yung aming uh, bunga, pagmamahal sa kanya, bunga pag-indibusyon. Hindi, hindi kami kaya hadlangan eh. Kasi, karapatan namin yun eh. Diba? Yung tulad ng trust nasa, sabi mga kanina, sir. Gordo na lang po nila itong uh, paligid ng uh, kaya po ng translasyon. Nagpupumili pa rin kami kahit pasilayan namin yung tahanan niya. Masaya na kami. 
na may kasalan yung kami namin at makapagpasalamat sa kanya sa araw ng restasyon. Walang makakapigil. Walang makakapigil. Kaya narangan mo ng tangke. <clears throat> Sususugan ko yung tanong na yan na ang pasasagutin ko naman ay si Sister Beth. No? Paano binago ng COVID-19 yung tinatawag nating dynamics of faith o pananampalataya sa poong Nazareno? Kasi ang pandemya para kang nakahouse arrest, hindi ba? E ikaw pa naman ang, yung role mo pa naman para sa simbahan uh, bilang uh, lay head of the handmaids. No? of the Black Nazarene, kailangan ng physical na presensya. Paano mo nas, nagampanan yung tungkuli na yun? Tulad nila, hindi rin po kami napigil ang isa kong mag-start na ipanan ng pandemya. Mula po yung pandemya, uh, na marami po yung na ipubisa ng pandemya. Wala ang COVID-19 na yan sa pananumpala pa yan. Dahil hindi ano lang yan eh. Pagka sakit lang, tulad ko, yung mga sabi ko sa inyo. Napakaganda ng pinaghuhugutan, napakaganda at napakalalim ng hugot ni Sister Lilibeth. No? At sigurado ako maraming deboto ang mailulugar ang kanilang sarili sa pinagdaanan ni Sister Lilibeth. Um, nabanggit niya na kung maaari lamang sana ay huwag na siyang maging bahagi ng round table. Pero siguro may purpose kaya siya bahagi ng roundtable discussion na ito. Yung kanyang karanasan ay magiging parang halimbawa, no? or yung uh, magbi, magdadala ng leksyon para magkaroon ng coping mechanism yung mga taong nagdadaan sa mabigat na pagsubok, lalo na sa pinagdaanan ni Sister Lilibet na may kaugnayan sa karamdaman ng anak. At nararamdaman ko ang sinasabi ni Sister Lilibet bilang isang ina. No? Kasi wala nang hihigit pa sa pagmamahal ng ina sa kanyang anak. Brother Robert, yung tanong mo naman para medyo gumaan. Hmm. No? Oh, Bagoy medyo natin, ano, oh, yung, may sasabi lang din ako oh, pwede oh, kay okay. Sister. So talaga sinubok ng pananampalataya ni Sister Lilibet. Okay. Sabi nga natin, ang daming kinuha ang daming binago ng pandemyang ito, pero isang bagay ang hindi niya nakuha sa atin, yung pananampalataya sa poong nasaren. At dahil dyan, ay saludo ako, Sister Lilibet, sa pinagdaanan mo. 
bihira yung ganyan tao no? na may pinagdaanan pero nagawa pa rin. At ngayon, isa ka ng inspirasyon sa aming mga deboto. Thank you po, sister. At para sa susunod natin ng tanong, ay, ito ay, sa paanong paraan nakatutulong ang poong nasareno sa pagpapatibay ng relasyon sa pamilya? Sa susunod na tanong, ano ang pinakamahalagang leksyon sa buhay na natutunan mo o natanggap mo sa poong nasareno bilang isang deboto? Brother? Brother ang Toto? Ang pinakamahalagang leksyon na natutunan ko sa aking pagdidebosyon yung ano eh. Yung mas magtiwala, mas kumapit sa kanya. Kasi sa kahit ano mong pagsubok na hindi mo sasama ng dasal, talagang malalig lang kayo, madadol ka. Pero kung yung uh, pasubo na dumating sa'yo, sasama ko ng pananampalataya at dasal, talagang pagkapit sa kanya, talagang walang imposible sa kanya kahit ano ba nang dumating na yun. Yung buwan. Hindi kailanman nabawasan kung sila yung pananampalataya mo. Kasi sa share with his sister David, di ba? Sinabi niya na may pagkakataon yung nagtalim siya. Bakit sa akin, papakit sa akin. Wala bang pagkakataon yung nagtalim siya. Meron lang, uh, may kwento ko lang po. Yung sa panganay ko po, yun nga po, yung uh, dinala ko sa simbahan, yung kasakit siya. Meron po akong kumbenta na ako na sinundan nung uh, tumulog ko. Yung po yun yung panahon na talagang uh, wala akong uh, hinihilalang gusto na. Kasi isang panganay ko lang, hindi ko panalangin ko eh. Yung isang panganay ko naman, gambar po yun, kung baga may ulang sa buwan eh. Uh, yung isa, uh, four months na lang ng siya ng asawa ko, yung isa, six months. Hindi po ganun na ito na yung nagkasabay yung panglaking bata. Kung saan yung four months po na baby, eh talagang namatay na. Na kailangan mo ma-operahin yung asawa ko nun na talaga pa... Uh, hindi, hindi na ako pero talaga sa kanya eh. Doon yun yung bakit nawala na ako ng pag-asa sa aking uh, pananampalataya. Na nung una, tinimig mo ako eh. Sana kung pangalawa, tinimig mo rin ako. May... Pwede makuha yung isang anak na six, six months kung maaga ang nagkagal. Kaya kung makikuha ko na nakaoperahan yung asawa ko, makasisarya, para makuha ko yung uh, patay na baby. Yung ano po, naging mga individu, may mga kanita, talagang uh, sa mulit niya, talagang uh, maaawa ka kung makikita niyo po yung anak ko kasi talagang uh, sa tuwing ubo ng buo ng dugo ng doktor, talagang uh, wala man, wala man marinig na boses sa kanya, 
Eh, nakikita mo sa itsura niya. Nasasaktan. Nasasaktan siya. Yung naiunag niya yung ibig niya, naiunag niya yung mga kamay niya. Yung po yun eh. Tapos yung kasawa ko ba, yung kasawa ko ba, yung nag-tilip-tilip na yung ako. Parang makakalat niya yung lason. Yung po yung way na napanghinahan ako ng loob na parang previous pa talaga. Na meron pa nga, meron pa nga binibinig sa mga panalangan ko para mailigtas man lang yung aking anak. Pumunta po ako sa hospital na nailabas ko yung asawa ko, uwi mo sa bahay. Yung asawa ko, iyak, nakiyak. Ako, nagpasalamat na rin ako dahil naging safe yung asawa ko. Pumunta po ako sa hospital, binalo ko yan ako. Nandun po may mga pumunta po mga foreigner na doktor, may mga daming doktor na nung araw na yun. May lumapit po kung may lumapit po isang doktor sa akin, kung saan hindi po pala yung nag-alaga sa baby. Sinabi niya, sir, tatapating ko na po kayo. Ito po nga kalagay ko ng anak mo. May 50% na mabubuhay siya. Talagang binigyan niya ako ng anak mo. Kaso nga lang, magiging lantang bulay siya. Kaya yung ibang isuwer niya yun. Mas lalong parang bumagsak ako lalo na na sa akin yung disisyon ng anak ko kung mabubuhay pa siya o hindi. Kasi pinagpili na po ako eh. Sir, kailangan niyo na ako pamili. Kung itutuloy pa po ba natin ito o hindi na. Eh talaga nga, hindi ko rin nasabi yung disisyon ko sa asawa ko naman. Talaga nga, nagulat na lang din yung asawa ko na yung mga buwi kami ng bahay. Nagpuyo ako ng bahay sinabi ko na may disisyon ako. Pero bago po yun, sabi ko dun sa doktor, Dok, bigyan niyo ako ng kahit konting oras lang para pag-isip ako kung ano yung yung aking nanag-isip para sa akin. May mabas po ako na. Mabas po ako ng hospital. Tumingin ako sa lahat. At sinabi ko sa Diyos, kung hindi na po para sa akin yung anak ko na yan, bigyan niyo po ako ng sign. Sirin niyo ma'am, may bumabang puting kalapati sa buong ng hospital. Iyon yung bigla mo pinabahan na tumitigil ba na yun po na talaga. Pagkasabi ko sa kanya, Lord, kung hindi na para sa akin, ito lang mo pang desisyon. Oo, tama. May tumapo na kalapati yung kulay ko dito sa iba ko na yun sa buong ng hospital na yun. Takong sana ko talagang nakatingin sa lahat. Kapag mas na po yun na pagpa ng kalapati ng kulay ko dito na yun. Doon pumasok sa isip ko na isubo ko na. Isubo ko na kahit labag sa loob ko, kahit masama yun. Ano ko talaga. Pero sa wing na yun, sa araw na yun, na nagsalita ako sa Diyos na ikaw na yung magdesisyon. Alam ko, dinimit niya ako na para hindi na rin mahirapan yung anak ko, para hindi na rin mahirapan yung mag-asawa. Siguro sabi ko, ito na yung sagot sa katanong ako, yung susuko ko na. Siguro yung pagbaba ng mga kalapati na yun, yung Holy Spirit, ma'am. Naman, oo nga naman. Kung dating ko dun sa ano, ang tanong sa akin agad yung nandung kalsel, ano po desisyon? Tanggalin niyo na po yung aparato. Kahit tabag sa loob ko. Nung hinuhugod po yung aparato na yun, habang tinatanggal yung mga oksigil, parang gusto ko ipabalik ulit. Kasi nakita ko po, lumalaban ko yan ako. Lumalaban pa siya na pilit niya na parang gusto niya mabuhay. Kaso nga lang, nagpag-desisyon yung naman niya na hindi na lang. Kasi ayoko rin naman na lumaki siya na nahihirapan din. Hindi ko ba mga. Kasi yun yung isa sa ginatil at nalang mo yun, na pagbilang sa libro, na hindi pala kailangan si mo buwa ka agad eh. Hindi ka kagad, hindi mo kagad kailangan isuko yung basta-basta yung ha, sa isang maling desisyon, sa bawat desisyon, hindi pala dapat yan. Hindi ko sinubukan kasi. Yun yung aral sa akin. Bakit hindi ko pala sinubukan na ipaglaban yung buhay yung anak niya? Bakit uh, binigay ko kagad? Bakit sinubukan ko kagad? Yun po yun namin. Pero yung uh, panahon na yun, talagang uh, nakakulang din ako. At doon na lang pinukumapit sa sinabi ko na hindi na para sa akin. Okay, yun, yung pagbaba ng kalapate ko. Pagbabog na lang yun. Pero nung nakita ako ha, pang uh, tinatanggay yung anak ko sa incubator, talaga nakikita ko naman na hindi malaban siya. Kaso, uh, para pag decision ako ko ng uh, isang pabigat na decision sa aking buhay na hanggang ngayon, eh, talagang uh, dela-dela ko. Hindi, hindi na tinag, eh. lalo ka na, lalo na, uh, lalo na pinangbunlad sa akin ng Panginoon na huwag kang sumuha. Huwag kang uh, panghihinaan ng lukas na sama mo na nagpadalaki. Siguro mga may pagsubok sa akin na yun, sa anak ko na yun, talagang uh, sabihin ko na nawala yung Diyos para sa akin. 
Mm. Kasi siguro oh, sasabihin natin na hinanapin din ako eh. Para mm. kami ng sistema. Hindi ka po. Ako po, sa protection po, ano, mas So ang leksyon una kay Brother Toto yung submission, complete submission to the will of God. Ito namang si Brother Raven ay si Brother Lance ay yung parang faith with action. Yan, yun yun yung uh, humiliya nung last Sunday, di ba? Napakaganda naman nung sinabi ni Lance, no? Sharing nila. Um, Sister Lilibet, anong pinakamahalagang leksyon? na natutunan mo bilang deboto. Sa bawat pinigilay na pagkakaroon sa akin, sa bawat sakit, sa bawat ito lang, labad lang, kapit lang, huwag mabawala ang panahon ng pag-aya. Dasal, huwag pipigil ng dasal. Kasi lahat na nangyayari sa atin, mawalang tayo ng isa sa mahal natin sa buhay, lalo na ang anak. Kasi, nakasabi ko na, walang, 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 Oo, oh, tama. tama. Sabi ko na tanggapin. Sabi ko na dapat ibigay. Minsan po talaga nung ibigay. Okay ako. At ito nga po eh, sa kapatid ka ba kayo ng pesos. Sa loob na, karapat, parang hindi po, karapat dapat na na ma-interview kasi na ako sa pinagdadaan ng ito. Kaya sabi niya na gising na ako sa sinabi niya. Walang karapat dapat sa mata ng tao sa lahat ng ginagawa natin. Kaya tandaan ko na rin, sa mata ng Diyos, lahat tayo karapat. 
Apologize um, for this unfortunate event. So uh, we promise to upload the full uh, proceedings in our uh, Nazareno uh, .org, uh, website. Okay, so we now continue with the second uh, batch of uh, paper presentations. So good morning once again to our devotees, scholars, and guests. So welcome to the second batch of paper presentations in this first national research forums on the Black Nazarene. So before we start, we remind our audience to mute their microphones. To our audience, you are encouraged to type your questions and comments in our chat box. So please identify yourself and indicate who the question is being addressed to. So our fifth paper presenter is a theologian, author, and scholar who hails from Hagonoy, Bulacan. He is currently pursuing a licensure in sacred theology in church history at the USD Faculty of Sacred Theology. He graduated with a Master of Arts degree in Systematic Theology and an MA in Pastoral Ministry at the Graduate School of Theology of the Immaculate Conception Major Seminary, Bigin po, Ulakan in 2019. He has been a core group member for Santigan for the Malolos Diocesan Commission on Social Communications since 2012 and new stringer for CBCP News since 2013. He is also a religious sector delegate for the first National Youth Forum on Heritage Network since 2015. He established Dom's Avria Ecclesiastical Designs in 2016, which specializes in church museum design, coats of arms creations, and historical profiling for symbolisms of ecclesiastical relics, priests, parishes, and organizations for several dioceses across the country. Moreover, our speaker is an active consultant to several national and diocesan shrine ministries in different dioceses since 2017. He published his book titled, The Role of Shrines in View of the New Evangelization, Pope Francis' Theology on Shrines and Pilgrimages, applied to the Philippine context in April of 2021. This book won the best book in the liturgy category for the 15th Highly Cardinal C Catholic Book Awards, which is part of the 43rd Catholic Mass Media Awards in 2021. So to present this research titled, The Historical Development of Shrines in Honor of the Black Nazarene in the Philippines, it is my honor to present to you a fellow Thomasian. Let's all welcome Brother Kendrick Ivan 
be panganiban. Okay, to all the participants of this first National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene. It is a blessing for me that I am able to talk to you and to discuss to you the research that I have made for this conference regarding the different shrines dedicated to the Black Nazarene here in the Philippines. To start, I am Brother Kendrick Ivan B. Paniban, a Catholic author based in Haguni, Bulacan, and uh, I have recently published a book entitled The Role of Shrines in View of the New Evangelization Pope Francis' Theology on Shrines and Pilgrimages Applied in the Philippine Context by Claritian Publications in 2021. This book allows us to see the different aspects of evangelization in our shrines, in our pilgrimage centers. And I know that our shrines are very, very valuable to us today, especially now that we are celebrating 500 years of Christianity here in our country. And from here, we would like to introduce the different shrines dedicated to the Black Nazarene. I think this is important as we do the research regarding the Black Nazarene devotion because from the originating place where this devotion came about in Quiapo, we come to understand that this devotion is not only in Quiapo, but it also belongs to all of the Filipino people. And this can be witnessed by the different shrines that have been erected in different places outside of Quiapo, outside of its originating place of devotion. That is why we're going to discuss Quiapo itself as a pilgrimage place and of course the different places that have been inspired by this devotion here in our country. Quiapo Church itself was founded in the year 1586 as a parish dedicated to St. John the Baptist. It is beside the River Pasig and it is for this reason that it became a uh, good place for a church because it is close to the different modes of transportation and it is also near the different marketplaces of that time. Even up to now, Quiapo is a bustling district in Manila and it serves as one of the hubs of the different uh, industries that are already present within the city of Manila. And this is something that has become a special thing for the church itself because the availability and the access that this area has allows us to see how in the past, during the Spanish era up to the present, many people can come to Quiapo. It was in 1787 that uh, the image of the Black Nazarene was brought to the Church of Quiapo from the Intramuros uh, district in Manila. And it was from this time that uh, the parish of Quiapo did not just become an ordinary church. It was visited by various pilgrims, not only from the city of Manila, but even from the other provinces. And as time went on through the centuries, it was this impetus of devotion that allowed Quiapo to be what it is today, a vibrant center of pilgrimage and devotion that we know from this, this point on in our lives. Every day, even if we are not in Quiapo, we know that the 9th of January will always be a special day for all Filipino Catholics because it is now a day of devotion to the Nazareno and it is already part of our culture. And it was uh, recognized by the Church. This is why in the year 1987, the Church of Quiapo, this vibrant center of pilgrimage, became a minor basilica. It became a papal church a sign of the faith of the people to Christ here in our country and also in different parts of Asia. In order for, for us to understand what we are go I am going to discuss with you with regards to Quiapo Church, we must first understand the different documents that have been discussed by the church and issued throughout the years when it comes to pilgrimages and shrines. So there are five essential documents that we, sh we must uh, understand in order for us to look into the different aspects of this talk. And this forms seven aspects, seven aspects of shrines in the new evangelization that I summarized in this book. These seven are being a center of the worship of God through the sacraments, 
the center of proclamation and witnessing through different forms of media, through preaching, and through the different works of evangelization. A center of devotion by having a unique devotion to a certain patron, of being able to aspire for greater glory of God through popular piety. Then it is also a center of catechesis because it has become a venue of different events concerning the life of the church, of the teachings of the Holy Father. It is also a center of cultural encounter because people come here to learn about the culture of the people, the faith that becomes part of the culture, which is what we call now as enculturation. There is also a center for charitable work, where this church is not only a symbol of the faith, but also a symbol of good works. Then it is also, lastly, a center for spiritual ecumenism, where it becomes a ground, a common ground, for the different kinds of people from different beliefs to gather together in order to pray and to appreciate the beauty of communion. Because of these different aspects, we are able to so evaluate, to give an assessment of these shrines. And if we're going to put this framework in Kiapo Church as we know it today, we can discover how Kiapo Church is performing or is excelling as a place of pilgrimage. So let's begin. If we say that Kiapo is a center of worship, we can see it from the different liturgical activities that are happening in the place. For example, if we're going to look into the liturgical scheme of Kiapo now, there are 12 masses during Sundays. In first Fridays, the special day for the Black Nazarene, there are 16 masses. During the second and fourth Fridays, there are 14 masses. And another special thing is during the translation on January 9, where from the early morning up to the evening, there are masses in the Basilica, 21 to be exact. And also, Kiapo is one of the most vibrant places for the sacrament of confession. As we know, we are going to Kiapo for confession during the time of uh, before the pandemic every 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And now even during the time of the pandemic, we are still celebrating confessions in Kiapo from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it is, this is one of the signs that Kiapo is truly effective as a center for worship because the sacraments are readily available even during the time of the pandemic. Kiapo can also be considered as a center of proclamation and witnessing. When it comes to the pastoral setup of Kiapo, we have one rector, two parochial vicars, which is enough, of course, for a uh, normal parish. But because this is a center of pilgrimage, there are also other priests who help Kiapo. And at present, there are 51 registered assistant clerics in Kiapo and one retired bishop who has volunteered to become a minister in Kiapo. This many uh, clerics can be seen as a sign of the due diligence, the aspirations of the Archdiocese of Manila to maintain Kiapo as a vibrant center of pilgrimage because through these priests, the sacraments are readily available for any pilgrim who comes to this place. When it comes to basic ecclesial communities, the parish of Kiapo uh, founded theirs in 2006. Then they have their regular formation every second Sunday and regular Bible studies in third Sunday. And also another important thing is social media. Kiapo Church has its own IT and social communications department. It is also interesting because they have their own website. They also have their own Facebook. They have their Instagram, Twitter. And now, at present, Kiapo Church also has a mobile application, downloadable both in uh, Apple and in Android. And these are signs for the development of this shrine, of this place of pilgrimage. Even during the pandemic, the social media has transformed religious activities, taking its sphere of influence beyond the spaces of worship, beyond the four corners of the church. It is also now available 
through the different forms of social media that we now have. And it is very interesting for us to see how the social media has grown. Because if we're going to look on the six major shrines, uh, the six most known shrines in the country, Kapo Church has the most number of followers because of its uh, dynamic schedule of activities which goes on a regular basis. At, at the moment, Kapo Church has 3,581,963 followers followed by the Manila Cathedral with 800,000 followers. The Basilica of the Santo Niño of Cebu that has 692 followers. Baclaran Church in Paranaque to the Mother of Perpetual Health that has 463,000 followers. The Basilica of Our Lady of Pia in Cagayan which has 351,000 followers. And the National Shrine of our Lady of Peace and Good Voyage in Antipolo Rizal that has 187,000 followers. From here, we can see how great is the influence that uh, Capo Church now has here in our country, in the Philippines. As a center of devotion, one cannot uh, uh, deny how Capo has become a vibrant center of devotion throughout the years. Fridays in Manila, is now called Quiapo Friday because everyone goes to Quiapo during that day. And even in outside parishes, outside of Quiapo, we can sell, see how people have their own images of the Black Nazarene in their churches. And they go about on doing the procession during Fridays because Fridays has become the particular day of devotion for the Black Nazarene. We have, of course, the translation the historic transfer of the image from the present site of uh, Quirino Grandstand, which was formerly uh, pla the place of the old church, then going to the new church in Quiapo. And this has become an important uh, event, not only in the city-wide level, but even in a national scale, because of all of the pilgrims that are going to Quiapo during that day. We can also see how Quiapo celebrates the Holy Week. It is also one of the most anticipated uh, liturgical events during the time of the uh, liturgical year in Manila because we celebrate the different uh, aspects of the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the Nazareno image is an image of Christ in his passion. There is also a large network a very, very huge network of devotees, of active volunteers of the Quiapo Church, and those are the Hijos del Nazareno. And we know that there are at least six, or I think now seven different groups that are forming this very large brotherhood of devotees to the Nazareno. There is also the replicas of the Nazareno that are not only distributed to parishes, but they are also brought in pastoral visits to different churches across the Philippines. There is, because of this, there is now a recognition of the image of the Nazareno. It is now a staple image, a common image seen in different churches because of the familiarity of the devotees both in Manila and across of Manila to the Black Nazarene. And of course, lastly, there is the Pagahaplos, the uh, constant effort of Filipinos to touch the image because touching the image of the Nazareno means for them touching uh, God and having God touch their own lives. And that makes the Quiapo Church a really vibrant center of devotion. When it comes to catechesis, surely Quiapo has proven also to become a good place where people converge together. Just imagine if we're going to look into the records of the Manila Police Department and the National Parks and Development Committee, through the five years from 2016 to 2020, there was a large increase on the pilgrims. So in 2016, there was an estimated number of 1, 000, 1 million pilgrims in Quiapo, going to 1,500 1, to 4 million in 2018, 
Then in 2020, even during the pandemic, there were still 3 million pilgrims going to Quiapo from Trino Grandstand. Another sign of this catechetical effort is what we call the Marian meeting rites. The moments when the uh, images of the Blessed Virgin Mary in churches that are near Quiapo Church um, participate in the annual translation of January 9. And they are able to participate by allowing their images to be seen outside of their churches for them to meet the sun, their Mary's son, the Nazareno, during his procession from Quirino Grandstand to Quiapo. So these uh, activities, these uh, efforts to have Marian meetings, to have a uh, dialogue, a sort of diorama of the Nazareno going up to Quiapo. That's why the route from Quiapo to Antipolo can actually be considered a pilgrimage route. It could even be declared perhaps in the future as a national or an international pilgrimage route. And if we're going to visit Quiapo itself, uh, Quiapo has its own rector office or office of formation. And these offices allow the uh, different pilgrims to be accommodated, to get in touch with the image of the Nazarene, for them to recognize the different aspects of the devotion and how they are able to become part of that devotion. Now, we can say that Quiapo is also a center of spiritual ecumenism because it has collaborated in the past with the Manila Archdiocese and Ministry on ecumenical and interfaith affairs. It has had various um, collaborations with different movements, for example, the Silsila Dialogue Movement for the Muslims. Then, recently in 2021, they had a partnership with IRIST Interfaith for one of the first virtual ecumenical conferences to be held in the Philippines. And this allows us to see that Quiapo is not only about the Catholics that are there, but also in collaboration with the different uh, Christian denominations, with the different religions in the Quiapo community. Quiapo can of course be also seen as a center of charitable work. It has the Lord of the Black Nazarene Foundation, which is one of the uh, unique setups for a basilica because its foundation based on the devotees of the basilica is able to give to those in need regularly. For example, it has programs of outreach to give to children and to those who are poor in um, impoverished communities. They also have legal and medical assistance for different peoples with certain needs, especially when it comes to times of destitution. So, Quiapo Church does not only become a place where you pray or where you entrust yourself to the mercy of God. There is also a place where you can have a helping hand. Then lastly, it is a center of culture because Quiapo Church itself was founded as one of the special churches in Manila and it has developed throughout the years and even can be seen as a cultural icon because of the different contributions that have been done in Quiapo Church in the past. For example, uh, one of the famous national artists for architecture, architect Juan F. Nactil, was the one who designed the 1935 design of the Quiapo Church. Then, even after the Second World War, when the rem remains of the church were preserved, it was enlarged. And it was enlarged by one of another uh, famous architect, architect Jose Maria Zaragoza. And it is actually the current design that we see today. If you're going to look even to the national cultural marker of the shrine, we can see that it was placed there in 1938. It means that even during that time, it is already considered one of the important cultural properties of the Philippines. And if we're going to look at uh, the pre cup or the Philippine Registry for Cultural Property, Quiapo Church itself is considered a tangible, immovable national cultural property. And the translation, the uh, very January 9 event that has been influential not only in Manila but across the nation, is an intangible cultural property of the city of Manila. Because of this, we can understand that Quiapo 
is now part of our culture. The Black Nazarene is part of the Filipino culture. And this can also be further realized when we see now the different shrines that have been established outside of Manila, outside of Quiapo. It is like bringing Quiapo to these different provinces, to these different parts of the Philippines, saying that these communities are also part of Quiapo. So there are four different shrines that can be found outside of Manila that are dedicated to the Black Nazarene. The first in Luzon is the diocesan shrine of the Poong Jesus Nazareno. It is found in Solano, Nueva Ecija, in the Diocese of Bayombong. It was founded as a parish dedicated to St. Louis Beltran, a Dominican friar, in 1735. Then it received the Callejero image from have a shrine, to have the church prepared to become a center of pilgrimage for the devotees of the Nazareno. Then that Kanyahero image that came to Bayumbong, the Diocese of Bayumbong, was later on donated to the Diocese. And that place where uh, the Nazareno came to, uh, by uh, the parish of Solano, was declared as the Diocesan Shrine. And it formally housed the image until there was an oratory that was established near the church itself and became the new home of the Callejero image of the Nazareno, which is now a property of the diocese. Then there is also another image in uh, Camarines Norte, which is different from the Quiapo image because it was endemic in that place. The image of the Nazareno in the diocesan shrine of the Black Nazarene of Capalonga in Camarines Norte was a uh, a different image from that of the Quiapo image. Although they're both black, but because this image was brought in that place uh, during the time when the Franciscans founded that parish in 1664, then the devotion of our Lady of the Black Nazarene in Kapalonga grew, and uh, the devotees who came to Kapalonga were not actually pure-blooded Filipinos. They were actually Chinese Filipinos. That's why there were not only um, Filipino churches uh, in the area, but there is also an area in the church that served the Chinese community. So they are doing the inculturated practices there of the kowtow, of offering incense to the image of the Nazareno. And uh, because of this vibrant devotion that uh, grew, among the local people of Kapalonga and the Chinese Filipinos in Kapalonga. Uh, it was this reason that the Diocese of Daet that covers the parish of Kapalonga uh, declared it as a diocesan shrine in 2009. The fourth shrine is the diocesan shrine of Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno in uh, Katarman in Northern Samar. It is the only shrine dedicated to the Black Nazarene in the Visayas region. And it eventually became a parish when it was also declared as a shrine in 2016. Uh, and uh, it is the first and only at the moment in the uh, Visayas region. And in 2021, the shrine partnered with the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Annunciation in Katarman for the Diocese and Penitential Walk. So the shrine uh, is not just uh, a different place from the cathedral itself, but it became spiritual linked with the Cathedral of Katarman. Then the last shrine, the fifth shrine, is the Archdiocesan Shrine and Parish of Jesus Nazareno in Cagayan de Oro City. Uh, this is unique. Uh, because of this, the Shrine of the Nazareno was declared as the center of pilgrimage of the Black Nazarene devotion in 2012. And since then, all of these places in Cagayan de Oro, in Northern Samar, in Bayumbong, in Kapalonga, uh, joined Quiapo during the translation because they also have their own simultaneous translation. So that there is also a recognition of the Nazareno devotion, not only in Quiapo, but in different pilgrimage centers across the country. And these shrines become participants to the nationwide Quiapo devotion, the nationwide devotion to the Black Nazarene. That is now, as I already said a while ago, 
become part and parcel of the Filipino culture because of our understanding that this suffering Christ, this image of the blessed uh, Son of God is able to bless us and is able to be one with us in our sufferings. So before we end this talk, we recognize how Kiapo, how the other shrines in the Black Nazarene become centers of the Catholics and to be able to share the gospel of Christ to others. And it is these qualities that are connected to the Lord that make Kiapo an important place because of mercy, of healing, and of oneness in the suffering of the people. And because of all of this, when we see Kiapo, we see the Philippines. When we see Kiapo, we see the Filipino people united together in that faith in Christ. Thank you very much and may the Black Nazarene be always a sign of mercy for all of us here. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Kendrick Ivan B. Pangaliban. Okay, so, so at this point, we would like to introduce the second paper presenter. Okay, so once again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Kenry Ivan Pangaliban, for your presentation. So our sixth paper presenter is an assistant professor in history at the School of Multidisciplinary Studies of De La Salle College, College of St. Denis. He obtained his Bachelor of Arts at the University of Santo Tomas in 1996 and his Master of Arts in History at the De La Salle University in 2003. So he also studied archaeology, the diploma program, at the University of the Philippines, Dimiman, and is planning to pursue his PhD in archaeology in the same institution. His fields of interest include historical archaeology, heritage management, sacred spaces, and popular devotion. So since 2009, he has completed three studies on various aspects of the Black Nazarene devotion, two of which were already published. So they're titled, Ijos de Enero Nueve Manila's Black Nazarene Procession as a Male Rite of Passage, published in 2010, and Translation at Roblox, The Pandemic and the Emergence of a Virtual Black Nazarene Sacred Space published in 2021. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome our sixth paper presenter, Assistant Professor Jose Alain J. Austria, who will deliver his research titled, Photo Photography as Panata, Raymond Gabby's Black Nazarene's Obra. Good day. This is Assistant Professor Jose Alain Austria from the La Salle College of St. Benilde. Allow me to present to you the salient points of my research entitled Photography as Panata, Raymond Gapis, Nazareno, Evra. 
This study explores the multiple narratives in the photography of a man whose body of work deals exclusively with the Nazareno devotion. In it, I tried to dissect his photography as historical documentation, as art, and as an expression of devotion to Christ. The devotion to the Black Nazarene is a very photogenic phenomenon, colorful, passionate, action-packed. It is not surprising that it is also the object of a photographer's gaze. There is a growing number of photographers who are also ardent devotees of the Nazareno. One of these is architect Raymond Gapi, a visual chronicler of this Christocentric devotion. Devotion to the suffering Christ started early for the Angono native. He spent his younger years participating in the Amba procession of Taitai, a Santo Entiero devotion with historical ties to the Quiapo cult. This served as his apprenticeship in the Nazareno subculture. As with other devotees, the catalyst of a formal panata and devotion to the Black Nazarene is a major personal or family crisis. In this case, it was the illness of his twin brother, Richard, that opened the doors of grace. After his brother's healing, Raymond started to participate in the translation as a solo, unaffiliated devotee. In 2014, he became a full-fledged Iho del Nazareno. Raymond took up photography as a hobby during his stint as an OFW in the Middle East. He is primarily self-taught as a photographer. Since he has a solid foundation in the arts and architecture, he is very much familiar with the elements of a good visual composition. Every time he would spend his vacation in the Philippines, which normally is in early January to coincide with the Quiapo Fiesta, he brought his camera with him to take photos of the procession. When he became an Iho in 2014, the Quiapo Church immediately noticed his talent. This paved the way for his stint as an official photographer for the Basilica's Social Communications Ministry. Let us now focus our attention on the photography of Raymond Gapi and its basic elements and characteristics. For most of us, the devotion is the translation. The Black Nazarene atop the Andas, surrounded by millions of devotees. It is a given that the translation and the other major Nazareno processions will be the highest priority in the list. One should not be absent during this very public display of devotion. So Raymond has a classical procession collection in his portfolio. This is the standard genre of pictures for those covering the Nazareno devotion. This picture, entitled Good Friday Procession, is Gapi at his most conventional. Practically, everybody who covers Nazareno processions must always feature the image and the crowd in one landscape frame. So, pictures like these are very common. What I do like about this composition is the way the Nazarene seems to float and skim above the Benetton crowd like a parao. There is dynamism in this picture. You can feel the force of the inner phalanx of Ihos as they try to go against the current of the sea of devotees. Raymond revealed to me later that this procession was actually a very painstakingly low, slow one in reality, almost static. But in this angle, he made a rather slow procession, very dynamic. So one can say that he really has a knack or fascination for anything that has something to do with movement. Gapi is not only interested in religious processions per se. 
he finds the more mundane, non-spiritual aspects of these events as equally fascinating subject matters as a whole. So yes, Raymond takes his gaze away from the procession to focus on other translation day stories and narratives, which are often given the same amount of attention or which are not given the same amount of attention simply because they are not religious in nature. In his still life entitled Clean and Clear, Gapi can be both humorous and sarcastic. But any person who participates in the annual translation knows his point very, very well. The immensity of the crowd is not proportional to the oh so little public utilities that caters to the very human needs of the devotees, including the need to go to the toilet. I know, because as a devotee myself who participates in the translation, this is a pressing concern for me. So why on earth will they turn their attention to a bunch of bottles filled with urine? Hey man, you're supposed to deal with the translation. Why focus your attention on the bottles filled with urine? Now, Gapi reveals that he does not shy away from these topics. Because for him, the Nazareno devotion, though religious, also have other faces to it. Some, like these, are quite uncomfortable. In his mind, a photographer must focus also on those mundane stories, those little stories, to show the complexity of the translation, not just as a religious procession, but as a human event. The translation is obviously the most popular feature of the Black Nazarene devotion. But it is wrong to conclude that it is that this is the full essence of the devotion, the totality of it. Many actually believe this erroneous notion. The translation in reality is just one of the ritual performances through which people express their devotion to Christ. Most of these are simpler, more quiet, more down to earth say, like me walking to the altar, as we see in this picture. In fact, for much of the year, Kiapo Church is the scene of these simpler performances, which magazine editors may find as non-editorial, activities which lacks drama and flair to make a good story. Now, Gapi does not share this sentiment. The penitential knee walking to the Senor is a very good example of this simpler, low-key rituals. This composition entitled Praying with My Father features a man from Cavite and her little daughter performing this devotional ritual. The title is obviously a play of the song Dance with My Father. You know, when you look at it, it is in the simple that we find the profundity of faith. This teacher speaks about humility, family, the thread that unites generations. Honestly, I like this picture, and I consider this as one of the more inspiring photos in this folio. One prominent feature of his photography is his fascination for the theme of brotherhood and fraternity within the Ihos Mamamasan subculture. He knows very well the workings of this male-dominated organization because he is a part of it. Of course, as a brotherhood, the Hijos del Nazareno has good sides and, you know, mundane sides as well. So it is not immune to human frailties and differences of temperament simply because of the religious nature of its organization. It is true, Gapi's best pictures deals with the edifying example of many of his brothers, but he does not shy away from showing their imperfections. Thus, we have a more holistic picture of the anthropological dynamics of the Ihos and the Mamamasans. The power of this photo, Akujan, lies in its stark honesty in portraying the organizational conflicts in brotherhoods like this. You know, boys will always be boys. Sparks will always fly. The tension in this photo is really palpable, no? It's actually a conflict between uh, people who belong to the same group and they wanted their turn in the Nazarena procession. The intensity of the emotion 
is written in the young man's face and body. So it's really a very good study on the masculine physicality, which so characterizes Nazareno processions. The devotion to the Black Nazarene appeals most to the Anawim, those who live in the fringes of society, those we call the urban poor. They find solace and comfort in the Poon's gaze. Scholars like Dr. Mark Calan of Ateneo and others cannot help but notice this. And so do photographers like Raymond Gapi. In his very simple composition, Paana Mga Deboto, you can see bare feet. Bare feet is often associated with the penitential spirit of Nazareno processions. What are the other things that we associate with bare feet? With dirty, at times injured, bare feet. Sacrifice, humility, poverty. All these themes converge in this very simple composition. These are the feet of those who are poor economically or in spirit. This is the very poor that Christ calls blessed. The Black Nazarene is a constant presence in the photographer's family home. Their San Mateo house is filled with framed photographs and artworks of the Senor. He really made it sure that all his children will grow up as devotees as well. It is therefore not surprising that he also produced a unique series of photos chronicling the growth of his children with the Black Nazarene devotion as the main backdrop. So this is a photograph from the Montoy series, Montoy being his youngest son. Carrying our burden is a picture that is both personal and allegorical. We can simply view it literally as a photograph of the piece, two youngest sons on the sidelines of a Nazareno procession. But in an allegorical sense, it is a very creative way of expressing the message of carrying the cross. See how the Kuya carries Montoy on his back. More important, see Montoy carrying a small image of the Nazareno. And then the image of the Nazareno himself carries the cross. So the message of carrying our burden is repeated thrice through the mediation of his own children and the objects that they are holding. Movement is an essential element of Gapi's compositions, particularly his procession pictures. Of course, if you are covering a very dynamic procession like the Traslacion, movement will always be the primary element of the photograph. This is primarily true with Gapi's Traslacion in motion. In this particular composition, the Nazareno and the devotees merge as one dynamic organism in motion. This picture was taken somewhere near Plaza del Carmen on the way to the Dungao. At the very moment that the procession is in the process of desalia, multiple exposure created this wonderful picture which shows the flow of the procession as a confluence of ghostly figures blurred colors and hyperactive movement that seems to bounce out of the frame so personally i find this photo very neat it is in fact my favorite photograph in this folio i like it so much i made it the cover of this presentation Raymond is also very fond of using the diagonal line, both as a balancing element or as a way to emphasize contrasts and dualities. In his most prominent and controversial photograph entitled State Power and Faith, which was taken during the translation of 2015, when there was a confirmed terror plot against the translation and also the papal visit, Okay, he took this photo and the most prominent element obviously that you could see is this diagonal line. Here the diagonal line cuts through the rectangular field that separates anti-terror snipers above the Quirino grandstand from the Traslacion sacred space which you see below. 
it also separates the coldness of the sniper's monochrome field via v the warm colors of the Nazareno devotees. In a way, the diagonal line serves as a dividing line between two opposite subjects and two contrasting color fields. He likes to manipulate the compositions, particularly color scheme, until the color scheme until it becomes a field of brightly intense colors. This gives his edited photographs a Gaudi character akin to folk painting traditions. One can say that Gapi is a photographic colorist. You know, for critics of art, this can be very, very polarizing. Some will like it for the intensity of color. Some would consider it as too colored, too bright for comfort. Whether you like it or not, hate it or not, it succeeds either way in getting the attention of the viewer. Procession ng Nazareno is a photograph that is interestingly popular among collectors and among the, uh, the religious priests in particular. While viewing this photo, I told Raymond, you know, your photo reminds me so much of the Angono masters, how they color their depictions of local festivals like that of San Clemente. You know, somehow the same spirit is here. And then he reminded me that he still carries with him the lively color palette of Angono's visual artist, who happens to be his buddies. So in hindsight, his edited photos is actually a deliberate attempt to find a synergy between photography and painting. He likes this style a lot, although he does not touch photographs which he deems perfect at the very onset. Okay. It is the plurality of narratives that adds mystique to Gapi's major works. He believes that a good photograph is one which contains or accommodates multiple interactions and narratives. He considers it a compliment when viewers linger for a while to decipher the multiple narratives embedded in some of his favorite pictures. Young Man with the Rosary is a work that is multi-layered. It is open to all forms of interpretations and narratives. When Gapi published this sometime in October for Rosary Month, his official narrative is that this is a visual call to pray the Holy Rosary, like what the young man is doing. Other viewers saw a different narrative. A young man in front of the basilica. It is a very sad, forlorn scene. The young man is crushed by life's burden on a very rainy day. So it is like a very, very sad picture. Intensely, the guy is intensely beseeching the senor for some unknown favor. So what's the backstory about it? It's a very, very powerful image that evokes different responses. But the backstory or the truth is, when Raymond went to the boy and asked him, what's wrong? Are you okay? And then the man from Bataan told him that he was just fixing his rosary. So what really happened is that the crucifix was detached from his rosary. And so he is trying to reattach it to his broken rosary. So much is his focus and concentration that onlookers thought that he was actually deep in prayer. Kind of humorous backstory here. Now, another example of this is the composition, The Gatekeeper. Plong or Ninong Ang Kanyamo, you know, Chicken Kanyamo is a very well known figure among the Eos del Nazareno, not just because he is a fully tattooed person, as if it matters, no? but more so as a gatekeeper during the Translation and Good Friday processions. So he is also the most you know, prominent uh, figure of the Porvida group, which who are responsible for opening the gates of the Basilica. Now, Raymond took this photo long range during the 2015 Good Friday procession. So the subject was totally unaware that he's being photographed. As the photographer comments, it is a rare pensive moment for a man known for his upbeat artistic temperament. In this photograph, everything has an air of silence. Plong is the sole figure in the composition, although Quiapo itself was very crowded at the time. His fully tattooed countenance and brown figure contrasts sharply with the blurred walls and steel bars. 
Gapi himself does not provide any formal explanation. It is basically a composition asking for engagement, for brainstorming, demanding that the viewer discover its meanings. When I presented this photograph during a, lect a lecture stint at Washington College in the United States, this portrait became the catalyst of many discussions on themes such as masculinities in religion, the stereotyping of tattooed individuals, inner city values and faith, etc., etc. So the power of the gatekeeper is that it triggers an endless process of reflection and wonder. The fact that his body of work is almost exclusively on the Black Nazarene is in itself a reflection of his deep, deep attachment or devotion to Christ. You know, he does not like to talk much about his spiritual life, no? But his captions and musings, Ray, his fit photographs, exposes this inner world, whether he likes it or not. And what I see, what I heard from him, is certainly profound. The Luang Hari is his favorite picture. The title reveals something deeper than a mere juxtaposition of two cultural icons, the Black Nazarene of Quiapo and Andres Bonifacio in this Manila monument. According to Gapi, this picture alludes to two kingdoms, that of God and that of man, which is so St. Augustine. For him, Bonifacio's revolution freed the people from the shackles of colonialism. Christ's revolution freed mankind from sin and death. And for Gapi, the latter, Christ, is the king, the one to whom all these burdened souls during the transition, these burdened souls gravitate towards Christ more than the secular hero. I think most of his popular photos, particularly Weeping Iho, um, shows much of this interiority. That time, the image of the Nazareno, that was around 2015, was manhandled by unruly devotees. So the image is a fragile mannequin, so it can easily be destroyed by all that mayhem. Out of the blue, Adam Rich Sanding, an Iho, jumped into the scene and embraced the statue to protect it from further damage. So you can see here the snapshots that shows the series of actions in this final composition. Okay. Now remember that the Ijos del Nazareno are the bodyguards of the Senor, and it is their primary duty to protect it at all cost. As you can see, Adam Rich Sanding is actually surrounded by other hijos who also did their duty at that time. But the way Gapi framed the last photo amplified the figure of the big burly Adam Rich Sanding into a figure of heroic proportions. It is really something that resonates deep within the soul of the viewer, especially to those who find the externals of the translation as rather unsettling or too rowdy for comfort. When I presented this during a 2016 conference here in the Philippines, the audience told me that the photo is very archetypal. First, you know, you seldom see, you know, Filipino machismo, a man crying, but it also forces them to reconsider their negative opinion of Nazareno devotees. Now they say they fully understand the profundity of the Quiapo phenomenon. Gapi's photography is never distant or unattached. As a photographer from within, the devotional subculture, his photos are always engaged, emphatic, emotive, and it does not apologize for being too personal. It is easy to sense that the photographer himself is making a clear religious statement addressed to others and himself. So this is primarily true with probably his most poignant picture so far, entitled The Blessing Hand of Christ. Gapi is very sensitive to the bodily gestures and things which he thinks have religious meaning. In this case, an extended hand, which you can see here at the bottom. Okay. Unknown to Gapi, there is one 
hijos del Nazareno. At the bottom of the picture, who is already dying of a massive heart attack at that very moment? In fact, later, Gapi and others were directly involved in rushing Renato Gurion to the Manila doctor's hospital where he was declared dead on arrival. Days later, Raymond came out with the picture and entitled that The Blessing Hand of Christ. There are many narratives in the picture, but Gapi prefers the Alter Christus narrative. In his final agony, Gurion shared in the passion of Christ. In death, he became another face of Christ. As you see here, the hand of Christ is very similar to the hand of Mr. Gurion. Was it conscious on his part? Or is it just a projection of Raymond Gapi's own faith in Christ? To wrap up this paper, Raymond Gapi's Nazareno Ever is a precious contribution to this new field called Nazareno studies. I think each photograph of his can be considered as a historical document, an artwork, and faith testimony. And I do hope that people in the future would appreciate not just his works, but other photographers' works, put it in the archives, because this will be very, very useful for those who would want to be historians of the Nazareno in the next few, the next centuries. But for me, no, this particular study also proves that the camera digital or not, is not just an instrument to capture images, but rather in the hands of a devotee. It is an instrument that is capable of probing the inner self where the Jesus Nazareno truly dwells. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Assistant Professor Austria, for your very unique presentation. We were all mesmerized by the artistic rendition, by the piece, uh, rendition of uh, the different representations of our devotion to the Nazareno. So at this point, uh, we will have our last uh, paper presenter for this um, forum. Okay, so our next paper presenter is a priest for the Catholic Archdiocese of Manila, ordained in the year 2021, and currently assigned as the parochial vicar of the Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene, Chiapa Church. He finished his Bachelor of Arts degree, major in philosophy, pre-divinity track in the Ateneo de Manila University in 2010. In the same institution, he also earned his Master of Arts degree in Philosophy in 2015 and the Theological Studies 2019. He also obtained his Ecclesiastical Baccalaureate degree in Sacred Theology in 2019 in the Loyola School of Theology. And he currently teaches philosophy in the Free Theology Studies Department of the Loyola School of Theology and in the Philosophy Department of the Ateneo de Manila University. His research interests include, among others, philosophy of religion, philosophical theology, philosophy and film and pop culture, and the history of ideas, particularly modern philosophy. So to present his research paper titled, Paradox and Distance, the Black Nazarene as icon for the devotee during the pandemic, it is with deep pride that I present Reverend Father Earl Allison P. Valdez. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. So let me take this opportunity since I'm um, part of the um, 
organizing committee of the conference to just present my uh, discussion uh, live. And uh, the title is Paradox and Distance, the Black Nazarene as Akon for the, pan for the devotee during the pandemic. Once visited the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno for a devotee, it's not complete without the traditional ways of showing one's own devotion and offering of prayers and intercessions. Among these is the Pahali, in which people line up in order to touch or kiss a part of the statue of the Black Nazarene placed at the altar of the Basilica. This is even magnified during the celebration of the Traslacion, especially in the recent years, where devotees from all over the country, even from abroad, line up to kiss or touch the image before the procession. From the lens of popular piety, we see that this in itself is devotion per se, a very corporeal expression of faith that signifies absolute dependence to the Poong Jesus Nazareno. This has remained to be a norm until the fateful arrival of SARS-CoV-2 in the country, which was soon known as the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to the highly contagious nature of the virus and the possible threat to the lives of many, the country was put on a strict lockdown. The national capital region was placed on enhanced community quarantine. And one of the measures that were imposed was the closure of churches. More than that, contact activities were prohibited, including the touching and kissing of images in the church. Yapo Church and the Nazareno is no exception, as the pahalik must be suspended, giving way instead to the patanao in which devotees from a distance can only look at the Nazareno as one of first prayers. Upon the loosening of these quarantine restrictions and the modifications of community quarantine levels, devo devotees were gradually allowed to perform acts of devotion sans this particular practice of the Pahali. Small as it may seem to be a modification, this presents a great challenge for the devotee especially if touch is identified as a form of connection with the divine, given the sacramental reality of divine presence. However, this study, viewed from the perspective of phenomenology and aesthetics, aims to show that these small modifications brings with it a great insight worth exploring. This is so because it touches upon the basic reality that the devotee experienced during the pandemic. In this forced distance, so to speak, Imposed by the situation, the devotee may find himself or herself distant from the Nazareno. But this distance, paradoxically, presents another form of intimacy, that of the gaze. Through the thought of philosopher Jean-Luc Marion, we see that in this situation, the Nazareno transforms into an icon. Properly speaking, in Greek, it is icon. One that gazes back and makes the devotee aware not only of his or her own situation in this pandemic, but also, and more importantly, the distance between God and the human person that cannot be traversed by human means alone. In the end, it points out that the reality of the distance is, paradoxically, a distance that also marks intimacy that God establishes with the human person. A distance that can only be traversed by nothing other than God himself as the absolute other placing himself out of charity in the situation of the human person. With this, we show that in this pandemic, a new and genuine relationship becomes established between the devotee and the Nazareno as an object of devotion, one that snugly fits in the circumstances that the human person is facing in this pandemic. This is to be discussed in three salient points. First, we see that this forced distance establishes the Nazareno more than just an image to be normally touched. That is, given the circumstances before the pandemic, the Nazareno serves as a devotional image that is meant to be touched as it is. This may seem to be a common feature among all the statues and images that we have for devotion. However, what makes this a significant phenomenon is precisely that reality that what devotees are all used to touching now only becomes an object to be gazed at. 
As one looks more closely into this phenomenon, we see that the Nazareno, in a way, and to a certain extent, becomes, quote-unquote, reduced, so to speak, to an image that is merely for sight. Being thus, we can consider that phenomenologically speaking, the Nazareno becomes an icon, following from the Greek icon as a form of art through which the believer is drawn to the divine reality portrayed in the icon. Of course, when one can contend that it does not have the same aesthetic characteristics as that of an icon, properly speaking, it is not a flat image but one that is three-dimensional. The Nazareno, unlike the famous icons in the history of the church, such as the Pantocrator or the visit of the angels by renowned icon painter Andre Rublo, the Nazareno does not gaze back as it stares into the supposed path that the Lord Jesus Christ walks as he carries the cross rendered in three dimensions. However, despite this lack of similarity with each other, we see that the relationship between the object of the devotion and the devotee becomes similar as that of the icon. It is by virtue of the distance that cannot be traversed by touch that the Nazareno becomes, in a way, an unfamiliar figure. One subject to be approached only on the level of the gaze with the devotee offering his or her prayers from a certain distance. In this similarity and difference, we bring out the basic reality of distance. Marion points out that an icon as an indication of the otherness of the divine that is portrayed in the icon. And what makes it so is that as the icon gazes back at the gaze of the subject who sees it and stares at it, in a way, the subject sees, quote, unquote, Nothing that is the hollow nature of the gaze. As Marion says, the icon opens in a face where man's sight and visages nothing, but goes back infinitely from the visible to the invisible by the grace of the visible itself. It is a gaze that resists objectification, one that conveys the reality of the absolute mystery of God that cannot be encapsulated by the senses or by the mind. The icon serves as a reminder that ultimately God is absolutely other. An otherness that is also glimpsed by the human subject as he or she stares back at the hollow pupils of another person. However, this other is an absolute other that is far distant and far more mysterious than the other person in his or her own flesh and blood. This mystery that surpasses physical characteristics and limitations, a mystery that overflows and goes beyond the categories of the mind. A, quote, unquote, saturated one, so to speak, becomes present in a very real way to the subject, even to the point of being defined by the very object that the subject gazes upon. How is this applied in the Nazareno during the time of the pandemic? The devotee as the one who gazes from a distance is now thrust into a new relationship with the object of his or her devotion. Though the Nazareno does not resemble that of an icon, it becomes an iconic representation, an icon in the form of a statue. A distance that is normally not there, normally traversed by touch, is established in this relationship. A distance that can only be realized in the very act of gazing, of looking at, which in turn serves as the only means through which the devotee comes into contact with the Nazareno. It is, phenomen phenomenologically speaking, a reminder that even the devotion to the Nazareno is not confi confined within the, the conventional, as the devotion is now re-established temporarily as it would or could be, so to speak, from the normal act of touching to that of merely gazing. The divine reality that the Nazareno symbolizes establishes a new relationship and a new form of devotion, at least or perhaps even beyond this pandemic, a pair of gazes 
that cross each other. This brings out a second point, namely that in reality, the Nazareno also mirrors several layers of distance that is present in the life of the devotee during the pandemic. On one level, we see here that the relationship between the Nazareno and the devotee brings out the very human reality that is in this pandemic the need for physical distancing. It becomes a norm and a practice during the pandemic as backed by health and scientific studies. But more than just a fact, it becomes perceived as a human reality that one has to adjust to. The distance between people, the distance between the human activities that one is used to, and the distance from the conventional reality that one has before the pandemic. In a way, this relationship between the Nazareno as an icon properly speaking reflects and mirrors the human condition in which it is situated. The gaze of the icon thus gazes back at the devotee and brings the reality of his or her situation to him. On a deeper level, however, it becomes a reminder of the insurmountable distance between God and the human person that which lies as the foundation of the resistance to familiarization and conceptualization. Indeed, for the devotee, the object of devotion appears distant, away from the intimacy of the touch. However, this situation is a reminder that while God remains close to the experience of the human person, one that can be known, seen, and even touched, there still remains something that cannot be completely understood about him. God then stands as the unfamiliar and the incomprehensible, one that the human cannot fully encapsulate in an idea and one that he or she cannot hold on to for his own personal interests and ends. As Marion states it, God remains as a phenomenon that fully saturates our thoughts and senses. One that you will not ever get used to. One that will always be an other to us. This distance, however, is something that is paradoxical in nature. And this shows the third point. The encounter with God in this manner, by seeking one's distance from Him, is also paradoxical in nature. As it indicates a form of intimacy that has never been taught before. For Marion, the encounter with God will always bear a reality that is contradicting, paradoxical in nature, one that brings out op opposite characteristics contained in one reality. As seen and explained earlier, the distance between the devotee and the Nazareno is a distance that is physical, one that also reminds one of the reality of the situation during the pandemic. Moreover, it reminds one of the distance that lies between God and the human person. Yet, it is in these realities that we see a greater intimacy, one that takes on a quite different form in this situation. And to see this requires an in-depth phenomenological reflection of the image to the help of Marion's concept of saturated phenomenon and revelation as per se, the saturated phenomenon in which what reveals is not measured and fit by the human subject but instead measures and fits the human subject according to how and what is revealed. And indeed, we see that the distance between the Nazareno and the devote is a shared distance, one in which the human being feels one's own distance from God and to the Nazareno, the distance is also present for God himself. In a way, there is an intimacy by relation through this shared distance. The Nazareno is precisely one with, to put it more strongly, in union with the devotee distanced from him, to which we may rhetorically ask, both from a phenomenological and even from a theological standpoint. How else does this God be in greater unity with a devotee who gazes upon him from a distance, if not in suffering as well in this distance? Do we not see that revelation bears the suffering brought by distance, and in this suffering, will brings himself closer? 
Does it not cross the distance precisely by sharing and uniting himself with that distance? Hindi ba't nakikiisa ang paghihirap o sa paghihirap ang poong Jesus na sareno sa pagiging malayo din ito. Sa dibotong pakiramdam ay malayo sa kanya. As Marion says in one of his seminal works in Revelation, a saturated phenomenon, the idol and distance, or again, between God and man, incommensurability alone makes intimacy possible because withdrawal alone defines the Father just as the paternal withdrawal alone seeks for man the sumptuous liberty of a son. Distance as he stands, therefore means duality alone allows recognition. Communion progresses with separation where phases are exchanged. Understood in this manner, we see how the paradox is all the more established here. The Nazareno indeed serves as an acon in the strictest sense, as it bears the situation to the devotee as the beholder and at the same time bears with that distance. The more that the devotee is forced to be far from the object of devotion, then also the more the Nazareno becomes closer to the one who gazes at him. And it is in this union in distance that we see the Nazareno as saturated phenomenon going beyond the usual confines of thought and entering into the very reality of the devotee, transforming the meaning in the crossing of the gazes and drawing toward the beholder to him. As a summary, these three points show that the pandemic has brought forth a unique and a quite unexpected relationship between the believer and the believed, the beholder and the beheld, the devotee and the Nazareno. As an icon, it brings forth the otherness of the object gazed at. In turn, this becomes the access to understand the crossing of the gazes anew, as being held in a distance which at the same time brings the Nazareno closer to the devotee. Theologically speaking, it becomes a moment of greater solidarity and unity of the suffering Christ and the suffering human. Of course, this comes only on the level of interpretation and philosophical reflection coming from the perspective of a phenomenology that puts the appearance and givenness of the phenomenon at hand. It may be further verified by more empirical and sociological studies on the effects of COVID-19 on the dynamics of devotion, specifically to the Nazarene. But at the very least, we have a philosophical starting point one to which we can say that even in the seeming fruitlessness of this quote-unquote modified devotion, one sees that it is full of meaning and indeed bears fruit in the lives of the devotees. A pleasant afternoon to, uh, to everybody. Viva po Jesus Nazareno. Thank you very much. Reverend Father Earl uh, Valdez. Okay, so in the interest of time, um, we regret to inform you that we could not have the Q&A at this point. Um, we would like to apologize to our three paper uh, presenters, Brother Kendrick uh, Panganiban, um, Professor Alain, Austria, and of course, Father Earl Valdez uh, for the delay. So we shall resume at exactly 1.15 this afternoon for our question and answer. So meanwhile, you can already type your questions and comments in our chat box. So thank you very much for staying with us this morning. And we will see you again at 1.15 this afternoon for the open forum. Bon appetit. Thank you.